Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things Meet Carly Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome everybody To the continuation of this episode of the Jams and Tea podcast Where um, We're picking off where we left off Uh in the Metallica episode, we covered the first five Metallica records, the uh, the golden age, if you will. And unlike other bands, there's really only two ages. There's the golden age and the dark age. And we're going straight into the dark age today. And we are going Before to be covering... times. We're going Before to cover everything they've made. The Rick Rubin. From Load to Hardwired to Self-Destruct. Also, uh, we are covering the album that came out in 2011. Yeah, 2011's right. uh, collaboration record with Lou Reed, Lulu. We're going to be talking about those albums today on this episode. Yeah. And boy, now do we I guess have, I will... boy, do I at least have plenty to say. That's good yeah. for you. Yeah. Good for you. Well, I had oh. to do something while I was listening for these albums, so that's, I wrote. That's, By that's God, I, I, have, just... I have plenty to say. I we, stared we starting dis- off with two right. albums. Well, starting yeah. off with two at yeah. once. Yeah, we're we're going to be talking about load and, and reload in conjunction here. Yeah, although because I've got enough I've got enough notes to do. I'll do individual reviews because I do think there's a dis- disparity in quality between the two. Even if I mean, sure, <laughs> you can yeah. say that. Uh, Morgan, why don't you contextualize us? Because we left off with the yes. Black Album. Uh, yeah. And there's still a there's a considerable uh, gap between th- that album and and load. Yeah, so... During which they were basically becoming the biggest band in the world. Exactly. Um, During the making of the Black Album and just that whole era, uh, the band, despite their massive success, was in, I mean, great personal turmoil. I think everybody in the band got divorced during that album cycle. Um so you know there was there was the Guns N' Roses show where there was like a riot afterwards it was just a hectic time and they were it was all in the process of becoming as Tyler said pretty much the biggest band in the world and uh you still you still with us yep you dropped out yeah i know okay cool anyway the uh, Guns N' Roses show yeah, um, there was a riot after that. It was a bizarre time, a lot going on. Um, so at the advent of all of this, we get uh, Load and Reload, uh, effectively uh, the same album. Uh, they were, it, was, it, was, it was originally conceived as a double album, but then they were like, this is just uh, too much. And look, um, so if we think about things in the LP area, I know this is like very much the CD era taking over here, but these are already like double albums in and of themselves, really. Like there's the level, yeah. of, the quantity of material here is 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 uh, vast. No, I think I think in total it's a little under two and a half hours between the two of them, which is um, two and a half agonizing hours. Yeah. Um, there's no point burying the lead. Uh, this is the worst shit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> um, it's just I want there's there's a running theme with the the podcast episodes that we're filming today, uh, particularly in in the the new releases and the. Uh, well, yeah, the, bo- in both the new releases and the Record Club episodes, uh, August's review of w- at least one of the albums contained therein starts with the words, are we serious? And um, almost the second that the track Ain't My Bitch starts, <laughs> the first thing you sit there and you say to yourself is, is this... Are you? St- are we serious with this? Is is this really what we're doing? And then it is. 
The uh, the two genders are "Ain't My Bitch" by Metallica and "That's My Bitch" by Kanye West and Jay Z. And then the non-binary answer to that would be "Smack My Bitch Up" by Prodigy. Yeah, which is the best song of all three. Easily. By far. <laughs> oh my, oh my god. god! This is not even a question. <laughs> but yeah, there's like a, a canyon in between those two things. <laughs> oh. Christ. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is really uh, the point where. Um, Basically, James as a vocalist and certainly as a lyricist, uh, what I mean, jumps the shark is not strong enough. No, it devolves. <laughs> it's it's devolved into, into complete self parody. And the sad thing is, is I really have no idea if they had any self awareness of what they were making during this time because this is like butt rock turned up to eleven. <laughs> It's just this is his, absolutely Sonic Adventure theme music level of lyricism there, 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 happening. There's butt rock and there's digging around in your ass crack rock. Like yeah. this, this this is the crack rock. I feel like I feel like every single shitty band of the early two thousands, uh, nickelback puddle of mud uh fucking trapped uh three of a dead man. Creed, uh, fucking uh, but cherry. Go on. They can oh, all God. They can all be traced back to these two albums in which Chad Kroger sits down and goes, "That's what I want to do. I want to do the Unforgiven Part Two. Well, look, and let's let's like actually. Um, sorry, finish your statement. Well, it's, it's just like they, they sat down and they said, "That's what we want to do," and it. Yeah. Well, let's talk about just, what 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 it is, what the do is. Sound. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so no. this is basically them trying to, well, not even trying to. It's, it's basically a bold move to shift away from thrash for the most part towards yep. hard rock. Yeah. Um, and and uh, everybody think, turned against them because they cut yeah. their hair and they changed their outfits and they weren't thrashing anymore, bro. Yeah, and I think this is the one time the the they sold out. People have been correct. <laughs> well, what it is I mean I disagree I don't think that Metallica have ever been sellouts because Metallica are so ego driven that every single direction they take uh, it just is so clearly like a pure um, reflection of what they want to do um, and, and, and the quality of it is not like have got anything to do with the influence of record labels or anything but rather their instincts as creators basically um, and you just see that um, once they realized that they had kind of pushed their their kind of admittedly limited but colorful thrash sound in the 80s to the basically the fullest extent that it could its original incarnation could go, which was with Injustice for All, they basically realized um, something had to change. Um, but what they did not realize, what they did not realize was that um, were... What the fuck? What? You're right. Who this? Are you mumbling to yourself? Oh, I I cut out. You all froze. Oh. Oh. Well. Okay. It sounded like you were mumbling to yourself, like fucking Grima worm tongue oh, or something. Oh no! I I absolutely was saying shit like this. Fucking computer. I'm gonna goddamn kill myself. This okay. tastes like garbage. Anyway, yeah, I, that yeah. that is. I did say. As that. I was saying, okay. like um, like. I think the the creative decisions that Metallica takes uh, from here on was in terms of like where they want to take their sound. It's not really a reflection of I think anything of the influence of outside parties. I don't think maybe to a, a small extent, like depending on what who the producer is. But like it, ultimately, they're too ego driven to uh, let anyone other than themselves, specifically James and Lars, really decide the direction of a record. And so what it comes down to is they, they realized their limitations, the limitations of their thrash sound at the end, towards the end of the 80s. They realized they had to change. But what they did not realize, what they lacked the self-awareness to realize and the, the modesty and the humbleness to realize is that as musicians, they are quite limited in their talent. And this is not, you know, to disparage the the great albums that they have made in any way or in some way devalue them but they are very good at specific things and when they're not doing those specific things that they're very good at they're very bad um <laughs> that said that yep. said i do think that um well i mean i'm gonna 
be up front and say that uh, while I do think that these are bad albums, uh, I do think there are some good songs scattered across them. You could probably make a solid eight song album out no, of the two of them. You could. Um, like an and eight I don't, song album. And I don't think Fine. either that I don't think that either of these as well are the worst Metallica album, although Reload does come close. But um let's like must be nice. Yeah. It doesn't start off well. Like it's it's you know <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Ain't My Bitch and Cure to get a dose of James Hetfield at his most hit fucking annoying. Um, and then you get the track Ronnie, which takes the blues elements of that they're weirdly playing with to their absolute limit and results in something which feels really juvenile, poser rock, um, Metallica at their most self parodic. Like they're clearly like trying earnestly to adopt an aesthetic, but they just know so little about it. And they are so poor at, at trying to figure out how to adjust to it that it just sounds re- like really, really off. Um, I do think, like, uh, conceptually, this idea of taking their sound specifically in a more hard rock and blues influenced direction uh, is kind of probably a smart and understandable one. Like, I get that. And I like the idea of it. Um, and I mean, the, the momentum of the 80s run could never have been sustained anyway, even if they tried, which was what made the Black Album such a smart decision from a marketing and spin direction. But I mean, you could hear, like I said, you could hear the band pushing at the outer limits of their thrash sound on Justice. So the rebranding of sorts that takes place here is, again, conceptually, smart idea. It's change, it's development, it's not so radical that it leaves all of their fans behind, but it is significant enough that it challenges them. And I believe that is the intention from the point of view of James and Lars. And where the band go wrong is in the songwriting, which, um, and also not even just in the songwriting, but also in failing to fully commit to the bit like there are tinges of metal on some of these tracks in fact if if not on most of these tracks there are definitely like tinges of their metal origins um but what the problem with that is that those tinges don't complement the new sonic direction they seem to be wanting to push it in they can't commit to their change in direction and what it results in is both load and reload having a sense of the band being at a musical crossroads, perpetually in a state of transition and, and terrified of, of fully committing to an idea that they're interested in, uh, you know, for fear that it will, you know, alienate everyone. And, and what that results is giving off the impression that you don't know what you're doing and that ends up alienating everyone. So it was, you know, it's kind of, tra- it's, it's tragic in a sense until you listen to the album and you realize that it's too irritating to be truly tragic because you can't really feel empathy for these guys. Um, and, and conversely, the not committing to it just leads to diluting the quality of either thing that they're doing. It's just yep. so, like, mm. comparing this to And Justice for All is like comparing, I don't know, fucking theory of a dead man to rush it's, yeah. it's rough uh, i mean look i i have said kind of hinted in the past that there are songs i like on load so i'll get this out of the way there are songs i like on load uh, yeah please do elaborate here uh <laughs> which which songs i i like the songs uh two by four uh i like that song i like king nothing i like hero yeah. of the day uh, i like bleeding me although that song is far too long uh, and maybe the most controversial pick for a song that I like. <laughs> this is gonna have you really laughing at me because I know this song is reviled, but I oh actually, god, please don't! I actually really quite enjoy the softer balladry of Mama Said. God uh, damn it! Which is not gonna win any awards for writing, but at least kind of feels <laughs> earnest and lived in. It has some country elements that I think are actually integrated, not like amazingly well, but you know, better than I ex- would have expected them to be. Um, but that said, the lyricism is really insipid and it can't be overlooked as easily on a track like Thorn Within, for example, which is just mind-numbingly dull. The most Metallica on autopilot shit on the whole album that basically aggressively insults and mocks with its void of character. Look, that's all I, like, I, there's a few songs there that I like. Wow. Uh, that's all I have to say positively. All of those songs were, uh, three uh, we're, every song you said there is in my three least favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that's great. Um, uh, 
the, the, the uh, closing track, The Outlaw Torn, has some cool enough uh, musical ideas, I guess, some killer riffs, and there are even some vague shades of prog in the structure of the song. But ultimately, it's nowhere near interesting enough to sustain 10 minutes. Um, and, and it just like, kind of ends the album on a really fatiguing, particularly fatiguing note, and also has me imagining a focused attempt at prog from Metallica, which... Uh, which would be quite something, I think. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I mean, loads of bad album. Um, the songs I do like don't really distract from the fact that I think it's a bad album because it's eighty minutes long. Um, uh, and, and yeah, I do have different, yeah. but and and considerably more negative thoughts on Reload. But uh, I want to hear what what you all think about Load in more detail than we've already heard, anyway. Look, Tyler, I respect you as a person and as a as a deliverer of opinions. Mm. But when I say that there is not a worse album to go easier on and look at academically than Load, I'm not I, looking at I, it academically. True. I just well, enjoy, I enjoy listening okay. to songs like King Nothing and Hero of the Day. Okay, let me more academically than I'm going to. Just because the only notable thing I can say nice about Load is that it does not annoy me as much as Reload. It well, is I a agree. vague complaint. But that is, in essence, this entire identity. Every flourish and every gesture at being different, or like when you say they try to be bluesy or try to infect their sound with country or prog or what the fuck ever, whenever this happens, it doesn't come off to me as trying to do who add these things that are genre it just sounds like they're doing the music they've been doing but bad it sounds like they've been doing it but they they are so bad at doing it that it becomes completely unrecognizable um i would like to point out the song uh which i don't hear people talk about as being terrible but i hate a lot which is poor twisted me um no it's pretty bad song yeah. it's it's a terrible fucking up. song and i hate it um it's it's not as bad as mama said which might be your most bewildering take look i know you didn't <laughs> say all nice things about it but this is like this isn't a nadir even on this record and this is like the creme de la creme of fucking bullshit and the i cr- just the cream of the crap the, the, the three song stretch of like the a lot of people would go to to, to to defend this album of Until It Sleeps, King Nothing, and, and Hero of the Day. I can't fucking stand Hero of the Day, first of all. That song sucks a fucking fat one. Until It Sleeps is fine if you like have never heard the Black Album, which is basically that song, but done 10 times and 10 times better on that track and king i if you're going to force a decent opinion out of me on this record i will say that king nothing is the vaguest of terms i will say listenable but the problem with load and reload is that they are long they are unfocused they are messy and the point at which it becomes truly terrible is because james hetfield is a meme we talked about this before and he could yeah. get he pushed himself to his limit occasionally yeah. on the black album there were moments where it's just like all right buddy you need to calm down but on here when he starts off and ain't my bitch you're just like is this yeah. what this era is going to be like and then it is and it is the mo- it is a nightmare it is a nightmare that lasts four hours it's four hours worth of material where he sounds like this yeah. all nightmare long you might say i completely agree uh james is the worst element of 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 every album we're going to talk about uh even like maybe matt maybe one of the worst elements of every single album we're going to talk about and certainly the worst this element is also of, the of beginning of the fall of lars ulrich and this is why he is known as the meme that he is not because he's a bad drummer or even because he does a particularly bad job on these albums he doesn't do great but it's because the inex Explicable way they mix him is I, no. I'm not. I'm, I'm gonna wait till Saint Anger to do that. I mean, I guess maybe we have to like. Obviously, Lars probably had the most, or definitely had the most input into how his drums yeah. sounded. But I also wonder about the influence of Bob Rock, who 
who I think is such a mediocre uh, producer. And and I don't know, just watching like some kind of uh, monster when uh, the documentary, and I just could see like he was alternately a pushover, but also like saying you should do this, you shouldn't do this. Like it was really interesting, weird kind of unfocused dynamic in the studio. So what the, basically what I'm getting at is even though I think that like relatively speaking, Load and Reload are produced fine. Um, especially compared to their other albums, like they sound yeah. decent, even if you know what's on them is not as you know good. But um, but I do think that they could have benefited from a more aggressive producer. I mean, they do definitely sound. I mean, like the best thing about them is that they sound better than Same Anger, which you know, low well, bar. Look, but look, they that's do. That's obvious. We have to kind of go deeper than that to really yeah. kind of talk about I, it. I know, but. That is to say, I think the production does them no favors here in that Metallica is a band that does well when they are gesturing at extremes. And the problem with this era is that they are doing nothing but half measures. They are doing nothing but combining a little of something, a little of something else, a little of uh, something else. And to the point where it doesn't come off as like a gesture at like a specific genre or style or sound or unified vision. It's it's just like when you said that they were, that like they aren't selling out. It's like, the problem with this album and the albums that follow isn't that they're selling out. It's that they're just obsessed with a sound that sounds like they're selling out. Yeah, sure. Like, yeah, perhaps their effort was not to sell out, but their, 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 their effort was to be low effort. <laughs> uh, August, how do you feel about load? Uh, so I mentioned I had a comparison for these two yes. albums, yeah. and it is to the uh, Lewis Black joke about the Democratic and Republican parties. <laughs> I know how, the fucking joke. <laughs> how the how the Democratic Party is a party of no ideas, and the Republican Party is a party of bad ideas. This is the Democratic Party of fucking albums. There is not. <laughs> a shred of an idea across this whole fucking eighty minutes. Like oh. you had eight, you had eighty minutes to come up with something that resembled an original idea, and I just don't hear it. It's just not even original, just interesting. It's or just coherent. Doing, it's just doing like. Lyrical, like dumb lyrical poses over like shitty butt rock, and <laughs> Metallica auto generate lyrics. Tom what York is... pulled words out of a hat to write everything in its right place, and it's still better than anything on here. <laughs> no, that's. Well, yeah. I, I have a bit more detailed thoughts on Reload, but I, I yeah. can't bring myself to form a fucking vague notion of an idea of what i think of any of this record because it's just i I think as Sertia put it about the (laughs) fucking killers record it's not even getting in one ear it's just struggles it's just happening you just it just happens and when it's over you're like it's 80 minutes later what you just feel angry that an hour, like you, you think like, wow, there's so many great films that are under 90 minutes that I could have watched instead of listening to this tepid dog shit. Look, I think as well, yeah. like, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I agree, but also like, I, I do feel like the need that, that I do like certain songs on this. So I can't like poo poo the no, record I mean, entirely. There's a couple I feel songs like, that I like also. I feel I like context, the context also damages the songs that I think are good here as well because like it doesn't necessarily matter so much if there are occasionally a good song on here when you've just been 80 minutes listening to what is for the most part a steaming turd but I think if you do take the best songs out um, and listen to them in isolation they do hold up genuinely I think that and I guess I, I guess like there's re- we're kind of an unstoppable force here is meeting an immovable object so it doesn't really matter that I yeah, like the songs no, really like. really no and it doesn't matter that I think they're on. all bad tepid mid-paced bullshit that I that's would true. rather so like I'd rather about... yeah but yeah I, I think that's really going to be our only major point of dissent this whole episode is that so I like some songs on the road there for us is the question. I mean... That is what? Sorry? Reload. Are, are we going to not well, do ratings? Are we going to do... Well, 
here, we're just, the funny we're thing is together. We, okay. Morgan put it best when we were talking about Exile on Main Street and Exile in Guyville when he said that we agreed so much over the last two episodes that we had to disagree at the start. And I think that's what this is. Is that I don't really think that all of us, like even like on opposite sides of this particular argumentative spectrum, I don't think that your thoughts on load and my thoughts on load are really that divorced from each other. No, that's like, exactly the thing. Look, let us yeah. let us achieve a sense of, of camaraderie by talking about reload, which I think is um, if if load is admittedly a steaming turd, then reload is a sewage facility. <laughs> uh, a sewage. Uh, I mean this. No, this is uh, load is bad enough. Give me five, give me double chances. Look, you know enough. what? You know what? Fuel sucks. Not even close to the worst song on no, the album. No, no, oh, it's probably not, the best. It not even know, fucking look, again close. Yeah. Again, there were about five songs on Load I liked to varying degrees. And I'm going to say it. There is two songs on Reload I think are all right. If one of them's Prince Charming, I'm going to give you a Colombian it, necktie. It's not. It's not. The, um, the, one of the songs I think is all right is The Memory Remains, which is okay. Uh, and I like Marion Faithful's presence on the song. It's jarring at first, but I think that it <laughs> does elevate it simply by having a point of contrast. Um and yeah, I think it's all right. I think it's a decent song. Um, that said, the lyricism on this album, like we're going to turn into broken records here, I know, but like it's every bit as bad and lazy as load and, and, and it's maybe even worse here. No, mar- like, markedly, well, I mean, markedly this, worse. Because this, like is, this is, load is, load is bad enough as is, but the reload is like loads leftovers. It, it, yeah, exactly. Like a load that, it's a load they were like, been, finessing like like really carving down the best stuff to fill out this album and i know i'm saying that sarcastically obviously so so this is what's rem- this is what remains this is the afterbirth and then you're look, just afterbirth reload <sighs> slithered out of your mother's, your mother's and there, there, there are a number of songs on reload where the band will just drop out entirely so that James can end a line and like suspended with a wicked grin on his face. And it just is so embarrassing. Like to listen comedy to. gold. Like what like, I said, like oh. exactly what I said about doing lyrical poses over like blues rock instruments. Sure. And, and, and like, what really stands out? The one I hit, it's not even the worst song on the album. Actually, let me see my track ratings to see what I gave it because it's pretty fucking bad. It, but no, it's not close to the worst song on the album, but it has some of the worst lyricism, and that's The Unforgiven, too. Yes! Um, no, yes! Yeah, no. If the we, greatest if I, song. We have to talk I, about The Unforgiven, too. If I disliked to t- The Unforgiven originally, imagine my shock and horror. <laughs> Well, the Unforgiven um, 2. I think I have an even more emotional dislike of The Unforgiven 2 because oh. I really like the original Unforgiven song. I, I, yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. It's a good Can song. Can I be fo- up front? I, I love The Unforgiven 2 because it is the worst thing ever. And by that <laughs> virtue, I can laugh my ass off it's, of that. Uh, it's very funny. Are you unfair? If you can understand the me, then I can understand the you. Like he's but, fucking Super Mario on this. Are song. you unforgiven too? <laughs> are you unforgiven too? <laughs> the party. Are you unforgiven? Lay beside you? me under wicked skies. <laughs> <laughs> Lay beside me. Oh no, we can scatter. Black heart, scarry, darker still, but there's no sun shining through. Uh. <laughs> yeah. It's the funniest thing. By the time I think, by the time you get to Slither, um, the thing starts to blend together in the worst way possible. It's like a caricature, a shadow of what Metallica once was. Like you guys have already said, lacking any commitment to a single focused idea and absolutely dedicating all their talent to being as unremarkable as possible. Um, I mean, look, there are at least some tracks on Reload where they try to complicate their otherwise bog standard and really dry attempts at hard rock with something that from a distance might be mistaken for inspiration. Like, I mean, 
the lyrically juvenile Carpe Diem Baby, which is just a, oh, a terrible I'm glad song. you brought that up. Uh, it, it like incorporates strings in a really subtle but intriguing way that points to a direction that could have been fruitful had they spent more time there, but it feels like almost a mistake. <laughs> oh boy! And like you know, every obviously everything else speaking, about that the song. The second half of this album is yeah. maybe the worst run of tracks I've ever experienced on oh, an album. There, there's one diamond in the rough, but I'll get to it. There's like because I said there were two songs I don't mind in this album, and there is the enlighten the, me. The other one is in the second half. Anyway, I'll get to it eventually. Um, the one song on the record where Jason Newstead has a writing credit, which is where the wild things are is uh, one, <laughs> one of the very few tracks where his bass contributions feel genuinely weighty and they're the one like remarkable thing in a sea of just horrendously overlong, dull, just endless <laughs> shit. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying there's a connection here between this being the first Metallica album uh, new st- wrote a song for and it also being the last Metallica album he appeared on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Um, okay, and the other song that I do kind of like... Like, that album, was the straw that broke the camel's back. The other song I do kind of like on this <sighs> album that I'm not going to lie and say I don't is Low Man's Lyric, which I think adopts a more alt-rock ballad esque approach, has absolutely nothing to do with metal, doesn't even try to be a metal song, and is honestly all the better for that. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, like a rare example of successful experimentation for this band. And, and it, it, you know, I, I like it. It's not an amazing song, but I like it. Look, I think it's, it's cool to see one... Like if, Obviously, they don't think that highly of it because they buried it in the back half of their B-Sides album. But I think the fact that it's a good song speaks to the fact that they have no absolute, no sense of whether what they're doing is good or, or good or not. They just create like a processing machine. They just churn out poop. Oh, it's such Sometimes a good you get something that's interesting for its stand out, for standing out from the rest of it. That said, uh, closer fixed. <laughs> Three X's. No. No. It sounds like a demo. It sounds like a fucking demo. And it ends. I mean, honestly, how it sounds is the least of its problems. It ends the album on maybe the sourest note of any Metallica record. This might be their worst closing track. Yeah, no. Yeah, it is. It's a, such a just poopy into the record. Like, I just yeah, I I, I don't even have anything else to say. Uh, I I I would like to just briefly elaborate on this record because I know saving Jake and Morgan for later is going for after me is going to be even is going to be the highlight of this. But uh, <sighs> yeah. As, as I said, this is the uh, nothing but bad. This is the bad ideas of that uh, Democrat Republican analogy, because this album is so consistently terrible. I just I can't help but laugh consistently at it. It is I find it almost almost enjoyable by virtue of just being some of the dumbest ideas ever and don't worry this i this uh thread will carry on into uh their next couple albums but i i i can't i cannot help but just just laugh out loud at, at how how much how much bad this is it's just what were you thinking? Why? Why is this the end product? When will you learn that your actions, your actions have consequences? consequences. <laughs> oh my God! It's 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 almost glorious in how terrible it is. But that's that's about what I have to say. And it's I not even. I, have, I, I hate like I think I have like more passionate dislike for other records, but like this is yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, we touched on the Unforgiven too, but uh, it, it's just a glorious failure, and it is not even the most glorious failure of their career, making it worthless. Yes, so, Morgan Jake, reload. Go off. Well, I guess I'll go first just because I know I'm, I'm not going to compare. But I think it's just interesting how the public at large views these album albums as being, like, lesser but acceptable, you know? Like, like you don't really find a lot of virulent hate for these records. And... You know, I pride myself on trying to be understanding, but uh, I don't get it. I don't see any context under which this could be deemed, like, like I don't get why people are just, like, unhesitantly. It's like, if you want to say St. Anger's the worst album just because that album's reputation and even its flaws are just so much more pronounced, but the fact that this is seen as, like, a significant step up is... It, it makes me feel like I'm in an episode of the Twilight Zone. I, I, am, I am flabbergasted, basically because Fuel, kicking off the album, is hilarious. And I agree Absolutely. with August. I agree with August in that also that The Unforgiven 2 is a highlight and that it is definitely, like, funny. And I will take what I can get. It is, it is a, a, a wading through of swampy shit water and this is like shit that smells significantly less awful uh and sure fine but the 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 b side of this album the second half beginning with carpe diem baby is the most excruciating thing i think i have ever experienced with music it like far and away for this podcast carpe diem baby what? Who okayed this? First of all, it's still mixed like shit. I know the production's better than in here than it is later down the line. Even you can say it on Death Magnetic. This song still sounds like dry anus. It is terrible. And the, like, the lyricism, uniformly, it, it, I have to imagine that it's delivered with a smug tongue-in-cheek in order to convince myself that a sane person was the person that penned it. And the, the pinnacle of this for me is Prince Charming. Maybe my least favorite Metallica song. This is the most insipidly written hard rock metal whatever song I think I've ever heard, beginning with the lines, there's a black cloud overhead, that's me. And the poison oh. ivy chokes the tree, again, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the Once filthy more. one on it is Bourbon also me. Street. <laughs> on Bourbon Street, you walk on by, I'm the little boy that pushes hard and makes him cry. This is grade school level rhyme schemes, James. Are you serious? And it is just the whole song. It has this just this pitiable delivery, this agonizing pace that makes every song feel like it is twice its own length. And it gets to the, where at the end he's saying, hey ma, hey ma, look at me. And it does, it. You, he sounds like a child. It's like when Tom Waits is screaming, he doesn't want to grow up at the end of Bone Machine if it was the worst thing imaginable. And of course, Lars Ulrich is the only other writing credit on that album because James and Lars had their heads so far up their asses that they turned their bodies inside out and then used the inside out bodies to play their instruments because that is the only explanation as to how the people who played the instruments on Injustice for All so proficiently played them so poorly and fucking, it, it sounds like sandpaper. It is dry, it is the Sahara, it is a nadir. It is like walking through a, it is like walking through Death Valley when it is recorded at high temperatures and you are having hallucinations about an oasis that you keep arriving at that never comes. Yeah. <sighs> oh. That's pretty bad, yeah. Morgan. I would just like 
to say that this cup at the beginning, at five o'clock today, when we started recording all of this co podcast content, this was filled with coffee because I needed to stay energized. Eagle-eyed viewers will know this is now tequila. This is why this album, not saying anger, this, because thinking about it is painful. Yep. Um, the interesting thing that has, I've, I've, the most interesting thing that has been said during the discussion of these two albums is that, again, it's just an opinion, but the, I've heard people say that the production of both of these albums is fine. I, uh, more power to you. I can't. I, mean, I said comparatively. That's, you know, I don't even think it gets away with it there. I, I was going to say, is, that qualifier doesn't make sense to me either. I'm sorry. I think, well, like, maybe mean, this is. I mean, comparatively, it sounds better than like most of the records that follow it. Still no. Um, no. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Saint Anger. That's the only one I would put below this. Yeah. Um, Death Magnetic sounds bad. It does not approach this, in my opinion. Um, this is like only one rung above Saint Anger in terms of just thin, warbly, crappy, tinny synths. <laughs> but they're not synths. They're guitars and drums. It's all tinny. <laughs> Oh, you, you, you do that, right. that, that meme. So it's all Timmy. It always has been. <laughs> <laughs> August, if you make that meme, I'll make it the thumbnail. Yeah, just, I, if it's I absolutely thing. will. You know I will. Yeah. And I will include, and the earth will be represented by a screenshot of you during that Timmy Sims moment. <laughs> You were saying, you know, Morgan. The, the bad production would be one thing because, I mean, it covers the whole album, both of them. But, you know, if the songs were good and, and if they were even competent occasionally, they, I mean, there would be something to get out of this. And the problem with the, the, the songs that are competent, like Fuel and The Memory Remains and King Nothing all come to mind there. The problem is that, like, they're just so aggressively able. They're just, like, they, they can. They can do it. They can do what they set out to do. But what they set out to do was uh like it's just so weak it's such weak sauce it sucks man and if that was as bad as the album got we'd be sitting at like a like a hard three light four out of ten like pre pretty bad but like it's the, the just just the depths to which this album sinks like fixer and fucking prince charming it's just how does an adult, how do several adults think this is okay to put out into the world? Like you are grown men with all of the resources in the world to educate yourselves. And you think this is, this is good to put out? Stop it. Get some help. I, I mean, and all that said, all that said, the biggest problem with both of these, especially together, is that they just don't end. It's, it, it never ends. It feels like being stuck in the fucking phantom zone with General Zod. It just it doesn't end, man. You just sit in there and you listen to this freaking crappy riffs that, like, that, like the first lesson of guitar is like covering fuel by metallica that's the level that that song is at 
it's 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 childish and irritating and stupid and appeals to the lowest common denominator and even after all that it has the nerve to be over an hour long no no I think something that these records highlight as well is how much the kind of character of, of what Metallica do or have done or did in the 80s anyway is so kind of like what what a lot of the what makes that character so kind of you know engaging and stuff is like the youthfulness of it the the freshness of it and the older Metallica get the more they lose that and it doesn't mean that they necessarily become unable to make good music but that they need to reckon with that if they are going to and and uh, shift their approach like James I'm obviously talk, speaking really about James not the band but like yeah James I mean even still now he's doing the same kind of shit with his writing that he did in at, in this era and in the like it, it, it's, it's just the same kind of like you know I think someone said it was childish and like that it read like a a a, a a young child's writing and then and i completely agree and it's like there's no there's no ambition in the writing there it's 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 yeah and it just feels like as they get older as, as james gets older it's it's you know a guy in his 30s and his 40s and his 50s trying to write like you know a snotty punky 20 year old and and it, you know it's just it's, it becomes embarrassing if i can be a bit more coherent yeah, in a criticism. It's that I mentioned that on these albums, they may not have set out to sell out, but they ended up sounding like they did. In terms of content, I feel people might sell the first couple Metallica albums short as being just like very visceral and nothing else, which they are visceral. That's the main appeal. That's the draw of the genre and the draw of those albums. But there is a depth there. They talk about things. They talk about serious things. They talk about war. They talk about the treatment of soldiers. They talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. They talk about dark things. Even on the Black Album, they talk about their family members struggling with cancer and dying. And the worst thing about these records is that even if they did it with the best intentions, is that they sound like they're selling out in terms of sonicness but when it comes to the content and the music if they were trying to write something heartfelt they did such a bad job that they sounded like sellouts which is an even more lamentable tragedy than anything else you can point out on these records it's that it is just such a woeful failure that it manages to fall short of even the most scant of expectations and trying to meet them halfway. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't really think so, uh, there's much else to So should we just say. get into uh, our kind of three favorite tracks, least favorite track rating? Look, since I actually have favorite tracks, I'll go first. I, I do yeah, too, why admittedly. don't you? <laughs> oh, okay. Then, Okay. Yeah, then, then you two can go right ahead. Okay, yeah, um, no, that's fine. My three favorite tricks on load are um, Hero of the Day, King Nothing, and 2x4. My least favorite track is actually what I think is the worst song across both releases, which is Ronnie, uh, which I really Fair. hate. I really Bad. hate that song so much. It's bottom five Metallica songs ever. But neither of these albums have their worst song ever, in my opinion, which we will get to. Oh, to me, there's like an easy answer to the question, what is the worst Metallica song? And believe me, it's coming up. But anyway, uh, those, are my, those are the tracks I like on Load, uh, and I'll give the album a 4 out of 10. And Reload-wise, uh, I don't have three tracks I like on Reload. I Like I said, I, I think The Memory Remains is all right. Tyler, you know what you got to do? What? You got to say it. Say what? Say what your uh, third favorite track on Reload is. Do I have to? Okay. Well, no, if I no, had to, I mean, it's not it's not a song on Reload, but you know what song it is. Do I? <laughs> I 
I mean, if I hit you know, the some some kind of foreign object in the sky. Yeah, it's a Chinese satellite. Okay. Oh, fuck. Oh, look, that's your bit, all right? I don't do that uh, bit. No. Okay. My I, two songs. The was... two songs I like on Reload are "Memory Remains" mm. and "Low Man's Lyric." And if I had to pick a third one, I'd pick "Fuel." Uh, the lead, the worst song <laughs> on uh, Reload is a fucking competition. Uh, I guess I'll pick "Bad Seed." No one's mentioned it yet, but it's a real abomination. Bad. I'll mention yeah. it. Uh, yeah. And uh, Reload gets a very light 2 out of 10. All right. So I guess uh, guess I can attempt some kind of going next. Because, uh, once again, want to save the uh, crowning achievements, the big gems here. Uh, favorite songs on load are uh, yeah, two by four, uh, King Nothing, and probably the Outlaw Torn. Least favorite is uh, Mama Said. I, I'd give it a uh, a four out of ten. And uh, Reload. Uh, my favorite songs there are going to be. Uh, Fuel, The Unforgiven 2, and uh, The Memory Remains, if only because those songs are all absolutely hilarious. And my least favorite song is, is fucking Fixer. And uh, I don't know. I, I guess I just don't have the same fire in my belly you all have for that album, but I'd also give it a 4 out of 10. They both suck ass. So, eh. I'm just going to go and see what albums uh, August has rated lower than Reload in the past on this podcast. Well, Gang of You, Gang of Yous, Go Farther and Lightness, only 0.5 better than Load and Reload. <laughs> I, I can literally like feel just a seething, like I feel there's an, a, an aura emanating from Morgan that I can feel because I am the closest to him. I am miles from his house and I feel a disturbance in the force. Yeah, what, are you, what, are you, well, what are you what are you talking about i'm not mad anyway anyway uh who wants to go next then so we can get this out of the way do it um i'm uh my three least favorite songs <laughs> on load are probably poor twisted me mama said and ronnie my favorite song is, is I give load a light, light three. Reload, my three least favorite songs are Prince Charming, Fixer, and Bad Seed. And I give that a strong one. Very good. Morgan. All right. <laughs> Uh, so for Morgan. load, um, uh, f- favorite track, uh, singular, uh, King Nothing. If you catch me on a day where I'm feeling nice, um, my least favorites are Hero of the Day, Mama Said, and Two by Four. And for that one, uh, a one point five out of ten. Um. For reload under uh, the favorite track portion, I have the word ha, as in like ha ha ha, with an exclamation point, as if to say, ha! <laughs> you jest! Um, that's not on the album. It's not a song on the album, but I, I agree with the spirit nonetheless. Um, my least favorite tracks are Fix <laughs> Sir, uh, Bad Seed, and the unforgiven two. Um, yeah, yeah, a uh, light one. I'd just like to to add an epilogue onto this. While listening to these two albums, I think halfway through, it it gave me a flashback to when I was a child, and I thought about how the concept of eternity frightened me. The thought of existing forever endlessly just felt terrifying. And when I listened to these, it made me feel okay with dying because at least I knew there was an end. Well, I mean, save some of that raw 
uh, the spear because you may need it. <laughs> oh boy, you weren't kidding. Oh boy. All right. So what about um the, no, the his, uh, what what about happened in between the interim between reload and Saint Anger? Brain damage. Oh, um, a fucking lot. <laughs> Weirdly, um, there is an uh, quite uh, quite a few years once again, even more than the break between uh, the Black Album and Load and Reload. Um, in that time, they released a B-Sides compilation called Garage Inc. Sort of collected... Another uh, B-Sides of... compilation. Yeah. Uh, markedly better than Reload. Um, <laughs> yeah. Had some, some, some new covers on it, but it was mostly Nick collecting... Nick Cave's Loverman... Yeah, it was mo- it was mostly collecting uh, old songs, old covers that appeared on EPs and played live. Um, there's not a, a whole lot of it that's very good. The best of it is taken from their '80s output, obviously. I mean, uh, also but- if you want a Metallica B sides, just listen to like five dollars ninety eight cents, which is just it's it's four songs. It's four covers. Yeah. And they're they're all fine. Yeah, that's that is absolutely what I'm referring to when I'm talking about the good oh, yeah. parts of Garage Inc. Yeah, um, no, I yeah. just wanted to make that dead clear. <laughs> yeah. Um it's it's worth a listen, I guess, but you really don't need to give it a a serious sit down or anything. There's some good stuff on there. There's some really bad stuff on there. What else is new? Um, and the in the uh, years previous to Saint Anger, there was also the Napster ordeal, which uh, uh, you yes. know Lars Ulrich sues Justin Timberlake in the Social Network. And you know it's a he he, he tries to stop uh, torrenting and fails miserably. It does not work. He wins the lawsuit, but you know culture moves past him as it often does for Lars Ulrich. And Very he's like somewhat... Lars's OJ moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. He gets off, but life is never the same. Yeah. Wow. Anyway. What a funny man. So, you know, like the past three albums before this, a lot of turmoil in the band during St. Anger's recording process. Well, and even before uh, it as well, because um, Jason yeah. Newstead's departure. Yeah, Newstead had bailed mm. at this point. Yeah. Um, and so the band yeah. were flailing for a new bassist, which is hilarious considering how little they actually utilize their bassists at this point in their career anyway. Uh-huh. Uh. But also the addiction stuff. I'm sorry, I just watched some kind of monster, so it's like all fresh in my head now, everything that was happening this time. So, um, so anyway, the recording process for St. Anger was fraught. Uh, James abruptly departed in the middle of it and to go to rehab. Uh, without, I think, telling the band. And so there was, they were kind of left in limbo for a while. Uh, and then eventually he came back uh, and basically had this idea to make this album oriented around the theme of, of rage, basically, and, and of dealing with your rage, with rage towards yourself, toward the world, toward everything, basically. Um, that's basically the theme that uh, runs across all of the songs on their much awaited 2003 album, St. Anger. And I think it is, uh, and like to really get a sense of the effect and the legacy of this record, you really have to appreciate how uh, anticipated it was. Like people were clamoring for this thing for years. Like it was really built up. Like it was a moment. Like the anticipation for this record was insane. Like, um, yeah. I can't even think of a comparable album rollout in terms of anticipation, but I mean, like probably Michael Jackson's Bad maybe is another one, except that album was, of course, good, relatively speaking anyway. But but that's a similar kind of um, sense of, of, of anticipation, I think, even though, yeah, 
I don't think the gap between Thriller and Bad was as wide as, as this one. But anyway, people were hoping that Metallica would, would return with more focused sound, I think, uh, uh, with a more renewed sense of purpose than the, um, the sense of untethered and unfixed floaty lostness that was all over Load and Reload, as we've discussed. And so what we got was um, Saint Anger. And, and it really, like, what I've come to appreciate is just how widely this was instantly reviled by even, by basically everyone. Like, even the most devout Metallica fans who had stuck with them for decades absolutely lost their shit over Saint Anger. And it's not difficult to see why saint anger oh no saint anger if i may be uh characteristically hyperbolic as i am wont to do i would make the claim that from what i've heard at least saint anger is the worst sounding in fact maybe just the worst general album ever released by a band remotely as big as metallica it is a colossal failure on pretty much every front that music can be critically, emotionally, sensorily evaluated. There are maybe individual moments within a couple of songs, like the occasional riff, that might be passable here. But there are no good songs on St. Anger, I don't think. Um, No. And I'm working my way up here to my um, peak of of rage towards this record because for me this is a record about anger as well it is about the anger Mm. that you feel when a band that have released multiple near perfect amazing records sink to the absolute mariana trench depths that saint anger represents so uh i've I've just got a question are you uh madly in anger with it Uh, let's let's start with frantic then (laughs) let's let's well i mean if only because it is the beginning and and if only because divorced from the way it sounds i do think that the the riff that kicks off frantic is is a good riff like it's not a bad riff in and of itself yeah i suppose yeah but then the song actually starts (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's just it's just so immediate and you get Lars Ulrich murdering Oscar the Grouch instead of playing the drums <laughs> and <clears throat> there, look much has been said about the drum sound on St. Anger I'm not going to pretend for a moment like I have some kind of uh insight about you know or or cool way of funny way of describing it that hasn't been used before because pretty much everything that can possibly be said about the way that the drums sound on saint anger has been said but my god it's like donald trump jokes right like every donald trump joke that can be made has been made but like what are you gonna do it's so bad (laughs) you can't do anything but laugh at it and because if you're not laughing at it you're crying and how bad it is. Um, it, it, I, I mean, I look, I've spent time trying to get into, I mean, I want to understand why. I just want, I want to understand why. I want to, I want to, I want to get it. I don't get it. Like how, how do you, <laughs> how do you like, how? <laughs> and look, I don't like the drumming is not even necessarily the worst aspect of the album. It's like definitely a, 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 a name, no. but it's not even like the worst aspect of the album. Like the album sounds like, I don't even know what to say. There's, <laughs> it sounds so Tyler, weird. there's no hyperbole on this earth. Even you as storied and as intelligent and as wide of a vocabulary as you have, you cannot hope to reach into your lexicon and grab something that can do justice to how this sounds. Look, and, and I want to say something that is, is only positive in the sense that it's kind of like an insult that it, you'll get what I mean when I say it. But like August said that like uh, Fuel and, and The Memory Remains and Unforgiven 2 were enjoyable because they're pure comedy. Uh, 
frantic is the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> frantic so is a work good. of comic genius. No, genuinely, like actually think about all of the things that, that James does on this song. Vocally. No, I don't have to. Um, uh, literally, the first time I heard the ascending frantic tick 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 tocks that just <laughs> that just <laughs> hit, tick, tick. And, and, and like by by the time <gasps> he's literally saying he I, I like, he's literally screaming it basically <laughs> and it, it sounds like a child oh i wish i thought of words but like you have to hear it to believe it and no, it's it's, no. and then you haven't even mentioned the uh, iconic line here. My lifestyle determines my death style, which honestly, you know, is a bad lyric. But it's not even like one of the worst lyrics. It's kind no. of like funny and, and, and but cute. What, what I, I would say it, all of the worst lyrics are in the same song. Here, here's what makes it. I no, think no, even no. worse. For Sorry, me. you go, you go, August, please. Uh, 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 it, it is just the delivery of that line it is so funny james hetfield just says it in like the most hilariously frank way like this is just some <laughs> commonly accepted sentiment in human culture just like well that's oh uh, yes the death, death style, death style. <laughs> yeah exactly of the long that's island all death style <laughs> Look, all, we can, all we can say about um frantic it is the like if I were to rank the songs in this album, it would be from from like worst to least worst. It would be near the least worst end. Yep. To be honest, My, maybe even the top. Yeah, I think. Okay, I'll jump ahead and say the one song that I think has has kind of got some redeeming qualities is the unnamed feeling, which I think is sort of approaches being all right, but is still kind of very flawed, and obviously sounds yeah, like didn't, shit. I didn't loathe it. But anyway, so, let's continue oh, I in sequence, not. I think, because the first, yeah. let's say, five songs of this are a particularly interesting sequence in terms of, um, you know, the feeling of falling off a cliff and, and seeing the ground approach. Um, Saint Anger, the title track. <laughs> I oh think God. that uh, I'm Madly in Anger with You is the worst lyric that James has ever written. It is so bad. And, and I think when you talk about vocal delivery, especially enhancing how bad something is, when you talk about vocal oh, no. delivery enhancing the badness of something, listen to the way that he delivers that line. I'm no, mentally in anger you're, with I'm... you! I'm mentally in anger with you! <laughs> and he says it so many times! Yes. God! It, just, it, it gets better each time. And he never gets respect, that St. Anger fella. He just never gets respect. Oh my god. What a what a brilliant idea. <laughs> yeah. Look. Yeah. Oh it, it, you flush it out all right. Look, you I'm just I'm flush just, yeah. it out. Some kind of monster. <laughs> Let's just keep moving on. Some kind of monster. <laughs> we have to. Is at least like not as bad as as the title track it's still pretty bad but it's not like that bad and at least it's a little bit better for the sense that the lyrics are more inane than attention grabbing and how bad they yeah. are uh, and oh. also i noticed on some kind of monster as well that that drum sound that tinny drum sound is at least mixed a bit lower on this track for some reason maybe because they realized it was so bad and they wanted to market the song i don't know I don't know why the, the drums are mixed lower. The tinny. I love that their solution to not wanting someone <laughs> to hear something is to just make it quieter instead of, you know, I don't know, fucking taking it out of the song? They haven't remastered this, eh? Have no. They? No, they, I don't think so. They, it's so funny. No, to they, me they have what? buried this what in the purpose? desert like E.T. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know, but like the thing is like when an album is negatively received for production reasons, you get like like Injustice for All, for example, even though that was still re re reasonably positively received, but there was a lot of complaints about the production. Then you remaster it, you know, you try and, and get people to kind of overlook the stuff they didn't like. But like the vitriol that was greeted at St. Anger was so ferocious that, you know, there was never a point in bothering, even for like and from the like, band's perspective. They didn't like making it. 
Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> exactly. Um, and the, no, it's it's incredibly apparent they didn't like making it on on the album. The songs it, are so long. Like some kind of monster is so long. It's so long. Why is it so long? And then you get it uh, truly. The, the pure vocal irritation of Dirty Window. Protector. Rejector. Uh, defector. Uh, infector. It's like a knife. That, 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 when, when, when James does that, when he picks that one, the, one, the rhyming thing where it's just one word and he rhymes, he gets the bunch of words Rejector. that end the same and defector. sees them like that. That's my least favorite. Of, uh, there's a big list of, of lyrical and, and vocal things that James does that I hate. But that is my least favorite. Because that's the one that is the most it, it, egregiously. It's, it's seriously dead. like some Eminem shit. Yeah, exactly. That's what it reminds me of. That. It's, it's, it's totally Eminem. Just... And then, okay, the worst song of Metallica's whole career for me is Invisible Ooh. Kid. No bones yeah. about it. Invisible Kid is 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 the nadir in a sea of nadirs. Uh, it, it feels endless. It feels it feels like. 15 minutes and it's and it's like half that and it's eight and a half minutes yeah. it, it it's embarrassing like it features some of the most asinine performances on the record from all band members but particularly james who who hits new lows in this joker origin story with lines like i hide inside i hurt inside i hide inside but i'll show you this, this is a song completely made up of that, that thing where he just rhymes the same word over and over again and gets on your nerves. That's the entire song. Yeah. But I, I feel like if you're trying to get someone to understand why Joker is like such a terrible movie, then you just need to play them Invisible Kid, which is the same thing. It's just in song form. Um, yeah. Somehow worse. Yeah, for sure. It is worse, despite the fact that it's eight minutes and Joker is a movie. <laughs> um, no, that's that's the impressive feat there, though. Yeah, it you, is. You've well got done. to admire that 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 the, ta- On, the talent it took. Yeah, to maybe make something the, transcendently maybe, awful. Maybe the only artistic merit the song has. Uh, on songs like Shoot Me Again, you also start to feel uh, the new metal influence that they kind of toy with. On this album, oh boy, <laughs> oh, regrettably, so so very regrettably. And you know what's so funny about the new metal influence that they toy with is that, like, in terms of like instrumental styles or or touches that they apply to this record, it's kind of like one of the least bad things about it. Because, like, I think if they went full new metal, it would be like the worst album of all time. But oh, like the would, fact that no, they it just... would also be the, <laughs> it would also be the funniest album. Yeah, for sure. Imagine a Limp Bizkit album, but like it's just like it's mixed so aggressively, awfully that it's just unlistenable. But like, I do think that like toying with that new metal influence at least is something that's not just the same lumbering slowness that they I, do on the rest of the record. Can I just say that Invisible Kid has? Four writing credits. Four. Four people wrote that song. Was, yeah. was one of them Lars With Aldrich. that first, yes. With one of, with, that, with that first grade rhyme scheme ass shit, it was Kirk Hammett, James Hetfield, and who else but Bob Rock and Lars Ulrich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my um, gosh. The whole, yeah. That was the song the whole band put their effort into. Yep. Yep, yeah, like but... I like I like I said before, I think the unnamed feeling is is all right. Um, it's not great, but it does stand head and shoulders above everything around it. It has it has lines like "I rage, I hurt, I scream, I want to hate it all away," which actually reminded me of all things of Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> but 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 that kind of is there's a kind of I don't know. It's less embarrassing than some of the other stuff, even though it is kind of very. You know. But but we're approaching the second worst song on the album. Uh, Purify. Oh, you know it, buddy! Yeah, I mean, at oh least it's the God. shortest track on the album. It, sure, but it's also five minutes of no, the I was worst. To say. Of the worst thing. You know, shortest doesn't get a pass when the shortest is five minutes. That's true. This I don't know, is, I kind of like, I, kind, I don't think it's the worst, close to being the worst in the album. I like the kind of breakdown at the end of it. I think that's kind that's of That's right. nice for you. But but yeah, it's not a good song. I, I'm not gonna say that argue that it is. I just think it's like it's you know, 
in terms of tears of badness, it's there is definitely worse stuff on the album. Uh, uh, don't, then, don't you want to be skeleton? <laughs> don't let me. But I mean, look, I'm not going to defend the lyricism on this album at all. It's consistently no. horrendous. No, no, that's no, it's. And awful. you'll note that I did not it's do awful. that. I just said that I kind of liked the instrumental breakdown towards the end of it. So. No, you you. That, in fairness to you, you did say those exact words, so it is not a... Purify also a, has four credit. writing credits. <sighs> With it. Yeah, All Within My Hands, the closer, um, t- continues that trend of shitty and overlong closers, but I guess at least it's just bad rather than, like, offensively terrible, like Fixer is. Although, that said... You do the album does end in exclamations of kill, 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 kill from, from oh, yeah. and literally like that. There's Jones. some funny backstory to this song that it was actually like I believe it was something they did for like a kid's charity or something to that effect. Like that's what they made this song for, and they would like Is that why he like, sounds like a five year old on it? <laughs> Well, that, and it's hilarious that the song they made for that event, if I recall correctly, it, it ends with just saying, kill, kill, kill. Yeah. Like, there, there's an that's, irony to that. Uh, how... Half the lyrics are the title said over and over and over again. Yeah. Oh. Basically, it's, uh... it's a bad album. Yeah, I'm. I'm sh- hot. It's take. the worst. Like that's the worst Metallica album. I think it is. No, it anyway. is. To me, it I, is. See, here, here's here's the thing, is that with Saint Anger, I still feel more of a unified vision than I do with Reload, which trumps it for me, because it's just like even if you're going for something bad, you're still going for something. It's not like there's a wide breadth between them or anything. I enjoy them. Enjoy them. On Jake, about the same level. Jake, you're forgetting that this album sounds like rubbing sandpaper yeah, no, on your eardrum. It, it, it does. But here's the thing. As somebody who is as evolved as a music consumer, like, I, like again, Morgan brings up this comparison to joke often, but, like, I like swans. I like music that literally beats the shit out of me. So St. Anger, as terrible as it is, and I will go on on a slight tangent there as terrible as it is does not annoy me as much as as it once used to and but that said when returning to this album and when i was convinced that i hated reload more which i do is a testament to saint anger's badness because it did make me waver when i got to purify i was like is is this worse do i hate this more I don't know. It made me have to think about it, and that is the most damning thing that can possibly be said about it. It is just, just excruciating. Yeah, I mean, who wants to? Uh, anyone want to add? To okay, that? so I can. I want to clarify on this uh, all within my hands thing. Uh, it is the name of Metallica's nonprofit uh, charity foundation. <laughs> and the first time they played this song live, it was an acoustic arrangement for a uh, for a benefit for a uh, children's oh, yeah. school. There's a what Metallica. The f- there's a Metallica unplugged album. Is there really? Like, and there is. Uh, oh my god when from what era 90s i think it's yeah i mean i think it's load and reload yeah it might be oh, black album god. Either way, it's really bad so so that's that's the proper context there for that i hope that helps out your day it's worse. I mean, that's, a like. that's a terrible it's name that's a terrible name for a charity no, that's a terrible <laughs> name for a charity but what else are they going to call it like whiplash King nothing. <laughs> Fucking uh, creeping death. There's not, they're, they're short on options. Yeah. The unnamed feeling. <laughs> not going to say that one. Uh, 
I only remember that because I was looking at the track list of Saint Anger. <laughs> August, oh. do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I mean, this album, it, it sounds like Metallica heard the, heard the name Garage Rock Revival as a genre tag, and they thought, oh, that means you play music really shittily, and it sounds like ass. It, it makes no sense why a professional band would make an album that sounds like this. It, it, it boggles the mind. It is such a Saint, fascinating... Saint Anger is a concept album about being a toilet. It's... That's, I was going to say, it's that is the first album. thing I ju- That is the first thing I heard when I joined back. Concept album about <laughs> being a toilet. It, it's a concept album where the concept is that it sucks. Yeah. It's, that's, 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 that's... I was about to say that's Metallica, but no. Shoot me again, yep. That's right. Yep. Oh, yep. You can say that again. Oh my I would God, like to be shot. That's, uh, I mean, most of the bases have been covered as to like just how terrible the songwriting is, how There's... terrible the drums sound. Every, every instrument sounds just like, like it was filtered through on no 700 tin cans. <sighs> yeah. I don't I get it. it. It's it's almost tragic. Like like James Hetfield almost. was trying to write this like no almost with emphasis because like James Hetfield is trying to write this emotional tear jerking letting go of your anger angry Hulk fucking oh. style album. And this is definitely the fucking Ang Lee Hulk of fucking albums. And it's just the worst thing ever. It's so <laughs> bad. I think I broke Tyler. <laughs> it's, it's genuine artistic expression, and it's a disaster. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry, we broke him, guys. Let's go to we our favorite him. tracks and ratings. <laughs> no, Morgan, do you have anything? Well, I, I guess I, w- I guess I won't talk. <laughs> no, oh, sorry, please. sorry. Yeah, um, please. Well, I mean, it's not like I have much to add. It's not like I have any hot takes about this album. I I rank load and reload lower than this, but I really I think they're about on par. The only reason I dislike Load and Reload more is just because, like, Saint Anger feels like a product of something, you know? It feels like the result of, product you of know... The fucking th- color. Th- <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. It feels like the result <laughs> of years Murdering of music. artistic frustration and... Just frustration in general. So, like, at least it's in, it's an it's an interesting failure. Oh shit! Um, but it is it, the, the load and reload are just not interesting failures in any way. But I mean, no bones about it; they're about on the same level of failure, which is uh, just. I mean, why three albums in a row? It's you know what you know impressive. what I'm going to do. Before we, I'm gonna find this for a second. But hang on. Before we wrap this album up, I want to read because uh, I watched some kind of monster, and in that, oh, in that, um, fuck, where is it? In that, uh, fuck, shit. Never mind. I have to find it. I was gonna read uh, a list of the working titles for this album. Oh, oh my god, because uh, they're really good. They're so I need to good. Uh, I, I think I already said it in the chat, like when I watched the the, the film. But I'm going to find them again anyway, because uh, these are this is this is pure humor, and it's honestly more interesting than than these albums are to talk about. Um, hang on. Oh, where the fuck is it? No. <laughs> Oh, you did a fucking. Oh, I hate uh, that. That's the worst. Fe- that hurt um, so bad. You get a right. Charlie horse in your chin. So here, here are the album titles that were displayed on a whiteboard in the studio 
towards the end of the uh, production oh, of Saint Anger. I need to hear these. Uh, old, un- old, ugly, nasty. Yep. Best dressed okay. chicken in town. <laughs> Butchered. <laughs> Oh yeah. Sarcasm with meaning. <laughs> what, the oh my God. <laughs> what the hell, dude? You believe this shit? Surfing the zeitgeist. <laughs> Unbridled. I ain't a scared no more. You just sit there to yourself and you think, man, Saint Anger is a terrible album title. And you're like, that's the best they could come up with. And the answer to that question is no yes. more. That is the best they could come up with. Oh my God, Jake. Look, look, I've not even got to the best ones yet. Floods of vomit. <laughs> well, at least that one's apt. We're already dead. <laughs> Light, hate, speed, love. My this favorite Coldplay punk. album right there. <laughs> We're just haunting together. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's either a Metallica album title or a Phoebe Bridgers lyric. This next one. Or, a, or a Megatheth title. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Feels so much better, Ellipsis, not to think. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I've got a few. There's still more. There's a few more. No, please. This was a big whiteboard. <laughs> Are, are you saving the best for last? I, I'm, look, I'm just reading them in the order they were written. Go, down. okay. Do it. But there, there's plenty of good stuff. No, here. keep, keep going. Uh, uh, satanic cuckoo clock. <laughs> uh, unresolve. <laughs> that, that's just factual. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I a am, genuine artistic expression. I am my own friend. <laughs> I, oh my god uh, it's just embarrassing in this next one the your is spelled uh, y-o-u-r not y-o-u apostrophe r-e but oh, okay. uh, like as if, in belonging yeah if you're broke you were never fixed <laughs> There's lots to unpack there. Yeah. Um, is is okay. that a command? And, and two more, just two more. Uh, every oh gift has its price. That just sucks. Yeah, that's, that's not bad. how gifts. That's not and how gifts work. Fi- <laughs> finally, the unclearness is very clear. <laughs> so those are all. Uh, r- look. I don't know how serious even they were taking them, but they were written down on the title whiteboard yeah. in their studio. You know, all of these things. You can see it in some kind of monster. Some, somehow, I, I have more insight into the album by result of hearing those. But yeah. St. Anger yep. truly is uh, the best dressed chicken in town. Um, <laughs> and honestly, I do agree with the band that it feels so much better not to think. Um, which that was the title. <laughs> yeah. Saint Anger. Is there's actually there's a scene in there's the scene in some kind of monster where they're actually sitting around the table deciding on the title and like they're all really <laughs> excited about this title, Saint Anger. And they're talking about how like how significant it is because like you know Saint Christopher and whatever. And they talk about all these saints and it's just so funny. It's like this they're 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 walking comedy troupe. They're Monty Python <laughs> if they made metal. They're, they're Monty Python if they didn't know they were Monty Python. Yeah, they are a social experiment. 
I feel right, like so. uh, I feel like we are a social experiment was also at the one point Saint Anger's title. Metallica is a psyop. But look, <laughs> okay, uh, let's do our favorite uh, tracks and ratings. Favorite yeah. tracks and ratings for Saint Anger. Oh my god, how do I? So, uh, um, I'll just we'll just go uh, on. Uh, how do I... Jake, why don't you go first? Well. My three least favorite tracks are Invisible Kid, Purify, and oh god, um, Dirty Window, uh, uh favorite track Chinese style, like, haha, funny meme, uh, funny meme, strong one, I, yeah, yeah, that's it, strong mm-hmm. one, yeah. August. Uh, my my favorite tracks are uh, Frantic, Saint Anger, and uh, Some Kind of Monster for their funny lyrics. And my least favorite tracks are uh, Dirty Window, Invisible Kid, My World, Shoot Me Up, Shoot Me Again, uh, Sweet Amber, The Unnamed Feeling, Purify, and Just all reading the rest of the t- album. <laughs> don't, mind exactly. yep. don't mind that. I was gonna do that. <laughs> well, uh, uh, it ain't my bit. <laughs> and and you rate uh, two out of ten. Boy, it ain't my bit. Um, two out of ten. It ain't. That's exactly what I was yeah. going for. I'm gonna yeah. go get a glass of water. Morgan, I my throat will die. My. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'd be lying if I said Frantic hadn't brought me a lot of joy in my life. <laughs> so um, I'm going to say that for my favorite track. Um, my my least favorite is favorites are The Invisible Kid, uh, My World, and Saint Anger, the title track, if only just because I really uh, hate the way he, he goes... Saint Anger. I hate it. 1.5. Um, okay. My favorite track is The Unnamed Feeling. Uh, and my three least favorite tracks are Invisible Kid. Again, worst song they've ever done. Uh, Dirty Window and All Within My Hands. And the album gets a very... Light one. I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna change my video background to re- reflect the new um, the new era of Metallica. Just a picture that, of Rick Rubin. <laughs> that would that would be good, but I feel Those like this bearded is, this glory. <laughs> I'll get out of the way so you can read it. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's very good i just okay. feel like that picture just even without the text embodies your energy <laughs> so much it, it really does <laughs> i can't explain just, why god i love that show <laughs> it's good it's real good hey august i changed my background <laughs> to reflect oh he can't hear me i changed my <sighs> background to reflect the uh the, the new era that we're in. Uh, okay, mm. so, a, a bit of time the off. the longest walk I've and ever taken. And I just Metallica hit the studio in 2007 or whatever the year was before this came out. Uh, yeah, uh, 2007 because 2008 was when it was released. And they team up with uh, producer extraordinaire Rick Rubin uh, uh, for Death Magnetic. And so I guess this is uh, their their Back to Basics album or their attempt at making a Back to Basics album, attempt yep. at kind of um, channeling the songwriting style that I guess made them famous or that they're, they're most beloved for. Uh, and I want to say, I don't have very much to say about Death Magnetic compared to the I other I don't records. think anyone does. Uh, I think that no. at least the songwriting is more competent, uh, or at least in terms of the musicality, is more competent yeah. than, than St. Anger. Even if I think the lyricism here is unforgivably bad as usual, uh, the best thing here is the Suicide and Redemption instrumental purely because it is an instrumental. That yeah. said, oh, absolutely. That said, I want to say 
this is brick wall to shit. It sounds awful. It's the second worst sounding Metallica album in yep. my opinion. And I, I would sooner listen to St. Anger again than listen to this again because I get entertainment value out of how bad that is. Whereas this just makes me sad because of how awful it sounds over top of arrangements that could have possibly been great if they had had more work and better production. Like for example, I think the first two tracks on the record and All Night Me Along are instrumentally pretty damn good, honestly. Yeah. Um, they Very. just are fucking unlistenable to me because they have been ruined by the production and it made me infuriated and I sat there the whole time. With Saint Anger it was kind of bemused embarrassment while I was listening to the listening to it. Uh with Death Magnetic, it was just pure white hot rage at Rick Rubin the entire time, with it mixed in with a little bit of rage at James Hetfield for continuing to be such a shitty writer. But um yeah. Uh I hate this album so much. <laughs> Uh, cool, wow. Yeah, and I'll let you say. I'm sure there is nice things that you will have to say about it because compared <clears> to Saint Anger and Load and Reload, absolutely. But I just wanted to get up front that I, it's like the Mad Men uh, meme where it's like I don't think about you at all, and that's me with Death <laughs> Magnetic. That's fair. That's fair. Mm, yeah. But anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I. <sighs> It's hard not to think of this in comparison to the last three albums. But, sure. uh, and it definitely comes off real favorably in that comparison. Definitely. But it's, it's also just, it doesn't, it sounds really bad. All of it sounds really bad. Oh, absolutely. Just, it's, oh, bad. Oh, boy. It's so, it's kind of almost comic the way that they, from load to here, that it kind of stumble th through different creative decisions that, that seem inspired to them. And it's, it's so bad. It's, it's funny like that they seem to not be able to see that each decision they make creatively is terrible in a completely different way. And that's kind of really funny to me. They're like, oh shit, we really fucked up with the, the drum sound on St. Anger. Everyone hates it. Don't worry, we're going to absolutely nail the, the mix of good production on, on Death Magnetic. We're going to make it sound so much better. And this is what we get. It would be funny if the album wasn't 75 fucking minutes. Yeah, and that's, that's another thing. It's just, again, it is too long. They Ugh. are unable to edit at this point in their career. Physically unable. Either that oh. is, or no one is telling them to, which is even worse. I, I mean, I think that could equally be the case because they're fucking Metallica. Are you going to question yeah. them on like, hey, you made it a cup? That, no, they, they make millions every year. Like, you know you're what? not going to say shit to them. I, I listened to, in the last couple of weeks, I listened to uh, McCluskey Do Dallas, which I obviously have talked about on the podcast being an amazing mm -hmm. album, and PJ Harvey's Rid of Me, both of which are produced by Steve Albini, and it has made me think, what if? What oh. if? Can you imagine, uh, like, a um, oh. clash between Lars, but who's very particular about his drum sound, and a producer like Steve Albini, who is just committed to making the drums sound punchy in the right ways? <laughs> Who ripped apart Exile and Guyville? Just oh, tangentially he, related. He, he did too. Yeah. yeah, that's a bad take. No. But, but regardless, yeah. no, uh, it's, I would love to hear. Wrong. I would love to hear um, a Steve Albini produced Metallica album. Oh, that would be <laughs> probably awesome. be great. Anyway, that's Improve totally them, unrelated. If nothing else, <laughs> get somebody mm. to sit that little potato-headed mullet bastard to, in his place. Ugh. it's just this is maybe like in in some ways this is the most frustrating metallica album all of them yep. have been infuriating to degrees for the the 15 years prior to this but none of them are just as like every single time you think they have it they just don't again like it's just it's better and it's more, you know, back to their roots and the compositions are more <clears throat> ambitious and they're more interesting, but the, the, the songwriting and lyrics are still awful, 
James still sounds like a parody of himself. And, you know, that's that again, I completely agreed that suicide and redemption is the best song on here. Um, just because no, there are no lyrics. There's, there's no one to ruin. By merit of there is less to fuck up. Yeah. It's, it's the M. Night Shyamalan principle of making something that is less hard to fuck up, so therefore you are theoretically better. Yeah, exactly. Better air quotes. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to be too hard on this, because <clears throat> there are songs on this that I like, okay? I think All Nightmare Long, and That Was Just Your Life, and the aforementioned Suicide side and redemption are all really good to good um it definitely has its moments but even those moments are just kind of tarnished by incompetent production and creative choices yeah and it's again that's the same thing of it being too long as well like this album doesn't need cyanide or the judas kiss oh or i my need oh, the oh, fucking oh. judas kiss jesus christ it certainly doesn't God. need the unforgiven three either <laughs> there's, there's maybe an ep's worth of, of solid material here yeah yeah although uh the one good thing i can say about cyanide is it has given me many memes over the time i have been familiar with it because as you know that is a uh, as you all three should know that is a particularly uh air quotes favorite metallica song of mine yeah in that it's so bad i uh, like I've been waiting for cyanide oh boy <laughs> i i love it's the pause I, I just... that kills it <laughs> I, I love the opening of that song where there's the well, 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 down, down, down. And when you learn that that's supposed to be like interpreting an SOS on the guitar, it's the funniest idea of all time. I don't. I, what? God, no. Because Jesus it's like Christ. the Morse code thing for SOS on a guitar. And that's what they're going for. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus Christ. That's why I mean, that intro is so bad. <laughs> I need some milk. <laughs> I need some milk. I think I think we I think we I think we all do. Oh, so I have so water. To speak. Water. Good water. Sugar. Yeah. Um, the the thing about this record is, God, I can't fucking say, like that's, that 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 is Morgan hit the nail on the head when he said that this is the most frustrating metallic album to talk about. In many ways, it's very comparable to, except you know without. All of the things that make it all almost more frustrating. It's very reminiscent of Baroness's Golden Beret, where it's just like, why does the production fucking sound like this? Because if it didn't, this would actually be a good release. And that's a good comparison. De De Death Magnetic would not be like a great release if the production was better. Like, I think this album played a lot better in my memory than it did when I revisited it because it, like, I listened to it back when I had a far less storied knowledge of music back when I, you know, back when I was a dumb baby shit and I just listened to albums and I was like, wow, loud sounds, this make music good. And yeah, Death Magnetic is, was, was, was fine if I was just listening to it as an album by the studio band Metallica, but revisiting it, especially in the context, like I was expecting this to be like a significant step up from Saint Anger and like, yeah, sure, it kind of is, but it's also a failure in like completely different ways, which just makes it so frustrating because it's just like, you're so close to having me actually enjoy this. But the fact that you just fucking insist on making records this goddamn long, even if the production was good, this album is twice as long as it should be. Why is the Judas Kiss eight minutes long? 
and yeah, Tyler's hatred of the bricked out production is not unwarranted. Rick Rubin is a bad producer. I don't like him. He's done some fine work, but he has mostly ruined a lot of things that he's touched and music that is good that he's produced succeeds in spite of him. And here that is not the case just because we're working with very mediocre material that is only just brought even further down by a, a hideously malformed and misshapen anchor that makes this ship pivot in circles. And you're just like, you're, you're waiting, you're waiting for the moment for you to be like, oh yeah, this is, I can say this is good. And it just never comes. <laughs> and also <laughs> fucking the day that never comes. It's just, it's, Bad. Just, it's just the unforgiven. It's just the Unforgiven. Mm. And then they made a sequel to Unforgiven 2 on the same album. It's the same song. You know, I, I see these like compilations on YouTube of like, it's all three parts of the Unforgiven. And I'm like, what a fucking waste of 20 minutes. <laughs> because that's how long they all are together. 20 minutes. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. And, you know, for things that compile the works of Metallica, that's still mercifully short. Oh, my God. And it's still a waste. Like, if this album was produced well, it would be like a, it would be like a light six. It would be decent. But it's not. It's It's bad. <laughs> I I think, think, think we're bad Rick Rubin's to... best. Sorry, uh, I think Rick Rick it. Rubin's best work might be the third Slipknot album. Without a trace <laughs> of irony. No, you're, you're probably right. I can't think Let's, of one that's better with his name on favorite it. Favorite tracks, least favorite tracks. Let's yeah. get into yep. them so we can yep. move on from this dumb album. No one cares. Let's get to the two we want to talk about. Yeah, this is the least essential Metallica album for understanding the band. <laughs> like, what what point does this serve? It, it serves yeah. the point that they're boomers who don't know how they it, make yeah. music. Yep, you did it. Anymore. Um, I don't get it. Anyway, yeah, regular yeah. order. Yeah. Sure. Uh, three favorite tracks: "All Nightmare Long," "Suicide and Redemption," and I'll throw out "That Was Just Your Life." I think that's an okay <laughs> opener. Um, and uh, I, 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 I hate to be so harsh, but I will, I will give the the album a strong a, a four point five. Mm. Yeah, uh, I don't know. That was just your life, uh, all nightmare long, suicide and redemption. Same. My, same as you, my, uh, I'm gonna say cyanide, but it's not really my least favorite in the sense that I've gotten so much joy out of making fun of it but it is the worst song on this album. So, five, I guess. Again, you're not going to have, I'm not, I don't care. Let's yeah, exactly, on. exactly. My three favorite tracks are the same three as the t everybody else, but Suicide and Redemption is my favorite. Um, my least favorite is The Day That Never Comes. I need Metallica to put away the acoustic guitars forever. <laughs> um, four and a half out of ten. Mm. Yep. Fair. Um, yeah, my three favorites are the same three. <laughs> um, my least favorite is Cyanide or maybe The Judas Kiss. One of those two. Um, sucks um, yeah, and I... Gonna look like a copycat, but I had four point five as my rating in my head before we did this. So yeah, so did I. Yeah. Um, uh, I. yeah, yeah. So let's talk about an interesting album. Oh, I'm thank just talk about Lou Reed, Metallica, Lou uh, Reed. I, oh. I have to. I have to. I have to change my background again. 
Oh please, <laughs> oh, please. Okay, do it, I'll, I'll give some. I'll give some context then. So, this is best. <laughs> this is best appreciated as, uh, or understood rather, as a Lou Reed album featuring Metallica as the studio where, band. Where they're ostensibly the studio band in the way of, like Toto's the studio band on. Which uh, is not to say yeah. that they didn't have any creative input because I believe yeah, that they did. Enough, so. yeah. But um, but yes, it is primarily the, under the direction of, of Lou Reed, who conceptually, I believe, uh, is adapting uh, some play. <laughs> Who the fuck knows? <laughs> I believe it's like a, a, a German doing play some or Andy Warhol shit. Um, yeah, but anyway, what is uh, interesting about this album is less yeah. kind of what it's about, and more than more kind of what Lou does with it, cons- with it as an idea, like as as a as an idea, like this idea of of Lou Reed of all people utilizing Metallica at this point in this juncture in their career, basically. Uh, and, and what it is, is Metallica had been making music, um, as we've established that for a long time that had been sounding self parodic, uh, flat, uh, unengaging, uh, lacking in inspiration, uh, frequently embarrassing. Um, and so I don't believe that Lou Reed, was under any kind of, I mean, Lou Reed smart uh, is a smart musician, even if he has some uh, questionable artistic, uh, cho- has made some questionable artistic choices over the years. But I do think he is a smart guy who understands, who understood where Metallica were at at that point in in their career, and understood their utility to him in crafting what I think is ultimately uh, one of the most uh, interesting subversions of a genre uh, that I have maybe ever encountered. So you get these kind of aesthetics of, of, of their kind of thrash style or their aesthetics of their metal style, where it's all about kind of like these chugging riffs and repetition and, and just the intensity uh, above all things. And, and what Lou does is he, he gets Metallica to do this uh, ad nauseum basically um, and he pairs it with these incredibly strange and, and esoteric stories and poetry about um, uh, sexual masochism and I believe a concept story about um, about a, a, a woman who goes on a dark sexual adventure basically um, and yeah so, Dark Sexual Adventure, one of the <laughs> titles for Saint Anchor. Yeah, it is it is difficult um to I think properly explain explain why this is interesting in a way that is not just oh like it's interesting because it sucks in a new way. Like it's actually interesting for what it it does. Uh, yeah. conceptually i think like and also i think what is also interesting about it is that it finds a new use for metallica <laughs> yeah. there you go it finds a new use for metallica instrumentally without actually getting them to change a lot of what they have been doing but just kind of breaking it down to something more <laughs> elemental um yeah i know it's the table very good <laughs> i'm sorry so, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to find reasons to laugh. <laughs> yeah, we, we so, need to have fun. Good so thing what, we're talking about so, this album. So basically, yeah. Metallica have had these kind of bombastic arrangements on their on their albums leading up to this, where the tracks are really, really long, and they go through all these different kind of movements, and it goes from riff to one riff to a different riff to a different riff. All this kind of like shifting nonsense, basically. And what uh, Lou does is he pairs them back and gets them. Uh, performing arrangements that are a lot more elemental, more minimal, more focused, uh, often um, quite uh, simplistic even. Uh, And what I think it does is that it brings out um, their strengths as performers, ironically enough, um, because a lot of the riffage here is actually quite, is actually really good. uh, And and uh, I think the focus that comes as a result of zeroing in on musical ideas and, and utilizing them in a, more, in a more punishing way through the lens of minimalism 
is much more interesting than trying to be punishing by just bombarding you with all this different stuff. Um, yeah. So for example, uh, I mean, I mean, look, the track pumping blood has, I think some of the most thrilling and impressive uh, musical playing that Metallica had delivered on a record uh, for a long time. Uh, and there's real uh, tangible, uh, you know, chemistry between, for example, Lars and Lou's call and response breakdown halfway through this track, uh, and then the broiling intensity of the track's <laughs> final stretch. I mean, what happens here through the relentless chugging and um, simplistic elemental um, heaviness is, is not that dissimilar to something that a band like Swans do, for example. Um, and and uh, the effect is really also not that dissimilar. I think what really stops people in their tracks is the way that Lou sounds on this album, which is almost deranged. His vocal cords have frayed and decayed in a very noticeable way, which uh, leaves him basically croaking the lyrics a lot to this record, or he sounds really kind of, you, you, you feel his age, and I'm not going to... Um, try and argue you know big brain wise that that Lou sounds good on this album because I don't think that he does but I think that the there is a contrast between um the chugging efficiency of what Metallica do and the raggedness of what Lou is doing on a lot of these tracks that makes for a really interesting combination I don't think it always works Notably, I think that um, they clash in a really ugly way on the first two tracks of this album. Um, Brandenburg Gate uh, is just a mess, to be honest. Oh my god. Uh, th th no wonder people don't like this album. Like, I'm going to play devil's advocate for it, as I think we all will. But yeah. when an album starts like this, I can't blame anyone for being like, what the fuck is this shit? For, for just saying no and stopping immediately. I mean, it's, it's yeah, understandable. Look, the album is, is so much better when the, the Metallica and Lou go into long form pieces and really you yeah. kind of like explore yes. um, dens the density in their arrangements. Not like the density in terms of there being a lot of things, but density in terms of like creating intensity through um, stretching things out. Uh, whereas when they try to um, create kind of um, more packageable versions of that, like on The View and also on, I think, Iced Honey as well, it doesn't, uh, although Iced Honey is probably is a noticeably better song than The View, but um, it doesn't uh, quite click because it feels like there is a clashing between between the two of them. And I, but also like... Um, that said, on a, on a song like The View, there is also entertainment value in the way that uh, Lou clearly purposefully amps up that self-parodic aspect that Metallica, Metallica have basically been doing for the la their last couple of records and makes it more kind of overt and entertaining. Um, that doesn't make it good. It just makes it interesting in a new way and, and funny in a way that I feel that feels more purposeful than the unintentionally funny um, previous stuff that they have created. Um, there's a, but, but also like when the, when Lou and, and Metallica really lock in sync and when they kind of really vibe together, like on a track like Mistress Dread, um, you just feel a synergy there that is really, really compelling, I think. Um, and I also think that the way that Lou perverts what Metallica do with his writing is interesting as well. Like the interesting thing about Metallica is that they've always been about this. They've always been this band about like creating intensity and, and metal and heaviness and ugliness and anger and all that sort of stuff. But James's writing has been so childish and just really pathetic and just like sanitary like he, he even when he like swears and stuff it feels very kind of like plasticky and just fake and 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 just, like when a child swears just yeah, to get no. a reaction whereas out of you, here, just like, exactly. whereas here and, you get Lou just, like, just whereas here you get Lou just painting these gory genuinely upsetting uh, images of just violence the, the and decay opening two lines i would cut my legs and tits off 
when I think of Boris Karloff and Kinski. Referencing Klaus Kinski. What a yeah. way. What a way. Yeah. Yeah, that's obviously like yeah. the decision to open the record with that line is 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 obviously very purposeful. But like the 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 tracks where there are real kind of diversions and discursions into really dark storytelling, um, in terms of like the 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 imagery that that's conjured is 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 really really um effective and and there are moments where um the record slows down as well uh like i like on the song little dog and actually generally i want to focus uh mostly on the second disc or the last four tracks yeah of the record which i think is uh where the it really kind of hits the stride um mm. frustration's good but i i really like the the creeping uh dread and just um uh unsettling feeling of little dog the lyricism in this track is very kind of like michael jira-esque he with lines yep. like um puny body and a tiny dick a little dog can make you sick pathetic little dog following its nose follow me around pathetic little dog it's very kind of like um jira-esque and it's just kind of like it really kind of get, gets under your skin with with how kind of starkly ugly it is um and and the atmosphere being um, extended for an, for a long period of time on that track really works as well. Uh, I like also a, a similar attempt at kind of um, stretching things out in a more minimal way on the song "Cheat on Me," although I do think that does go on a little too long. Yeah, um, but I kind of I appreciate what was what was they were attempting to do there. Although. <sighs> Again, that's also an example of a song where I think that there's an interesting conceptual idea, but it kind of clashes with uh, execution that I think is maybe unintentionally funny. And I'm, of course, referring to um, James shouting, why do I cheat on me? Why do I cheat on me? For at least a hundred times, I would say, um, in that <laughs> song. And, and uh, yeah, it's hard. That's an example of a, of a point on the record where it's hard for me to tell whether Lou is getting James to do this because he likes, um, he likes taking advantage of the fact that James has no self-awareness about how, how he sounds doing that or whether it's some kind of like genuinely inspired thing from their perspective. I don't know. That, that's a kind of point where it's hard to tell, but uh, then I want the, the best track on the record, I think. And uh, really the, piece that makes this whole exercise worth it and probably the best piece of music that for me that metallic have been involved in this century is the song dragon uh which is yep. incredible uh the um and uh, both and it's, it's a rare example of of a song where uh well not a rare example but it's it's particularly pointed here how the narrative and storytelling and lyricism of lou is complemented by the musicianship of the band like it's this really kind of devastating story uh where the central uh female character i believe of the of the play that the the album is loosely based on is kind of like reckoning with a, a betrayal basically by someone that 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 she loved or that or who cared for her and there's this really kind of dark lyricism and and, and loathing and hatred that feels re really tangible through that and just the actual instrumentation on the track um the riff in the song is so doomy it's so it's like doomy and dark and 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 really in a way that I've never heard from Metallica before sound quite like this. And I love it. Like I it's love almost post metal. Yeah. 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 That's a good, that's a good point. It, it is almost mm. post metal. And also uh, Kirk gives a couple, I think of, of solos on this track that are really like avant garde shit. Like he makes yeah. his guitar sound like ugly and mangled and not like a guitar in a way that is really interesting and actually like sounds interesting and good. Uh, and I really like that. Um, yeah. It's, just, it's, it's such an impressive piece of music and it just, it, it makes the most of its, of its lengthy runtime and just pummeling you and get and increasing the intensity through that um, rep repetitive motif um, all the way throughout the track and i really love that track uh, and then the record closes uh strongly but in a different way uh with uh the 20 minute junior dad junior which dad. is a, a ballad uh with a yeah. beautiful extended string drone uh that, oh, that carries uh the track out to its conclusion it, it's it's like 
Yeah, gosh, that's so And good. so basically, like, you have very little Metallica here. This is a moment where you really, like, realize, okay, no, no, this is Lou. And he's just bringing Metallica on, like, when he needs them, basically. Um, though they are, they are here, but, like, it's, it's, this is a moment where you really realize that this is basically Lou's goodbye, because this was the last album he made, and this is the last track on the last album that he made. And it's, it's a very kind of beautiful track. Um, and just the extended intro there is also yeah. very... Yeah, and it, it's you almost, get it's almost tear jerking, and just how how beautiful and yet simple it is. Yeah, definitely. Um, and there's it just there's moments of stark and arresting beauty on this track that made me think about all the moments of of similar beauty in different ways throughout uh, Lou's career as a solo artist and and his work with the Velvet Underground as well. Um, uh, the outro to this track almost sounds like Stars of the Lid, which is a, a drone ambient act that I absolutely adore uh, and listen to all the time. And if you had told me that Metallica would be performing uh, on an album which features a piece of music uh, that is extended and sounds like Stars of the Lid, I, I would never have believed it in a million years, but it exists. Uh, and yeah, so uh, th- I have really kind of, I've not talked about every part of this record. I figure that that you all are probably going to want to talk a bit more about some of the more, some of the earlier sections of the album, let's say, which are a bit less successful. But I do think that there is, and I, look, I don't think it's a great album. I think it's it's a pretty good album. Uh, and I think when it succeeds, it's really interesting and impressive. And, and I'm not trying to um, be contrarian. I mean, I know we're all basically relatively in agreement here, but I hope that our, our, our viewers don't think that we're being contrarian here. It's just that there is a yeah, lot of no. interesting experimentation that is done here with, with what Metallica is as a band, with what their sound, uh, the existing sound palette that they work with, what are the actual possibilities of it, if it is kind of explored in a more um, progressive way. And um, also just the interest, how interesting it is as an exercise to pervert something that is so established uh, such an established characteristic of one of the biggest bands in the world to actually come in there and just really pervert that and 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 make it dirty, uh, I think is just really kind of fascinating. But yeah, that's basically what I have to I, say about Lulu. I, I want to double down on what you've been saying and say that, like, when I talk about this album... I don't like like this in like an ironic way. Like I don't like music ironically just because I either like something or I don't. That's just not like I don't process music through like very many layers even though I can engage with conceptual art, which this is on some level, but like I just want to emphasize how much this had going against it when listening through the discography in order in that like I don't know if you gleaned from our Death Magnetic discussion, but, like, that album puts you through the ringer just because it's, like, you've endured the worst of it, and you just sit, you're just waiting, man. You are, it is, you are put through the ringer for a a long, long time. You've been enduring some of the worst material from this band, and it's, it's an assault. So when you get to this album, and you see the length of some of the songs, and when you see its reputation, like, this is a hated reviled release that is like it's, notoriously considered awful it's the lowest rated uh album by either artist on on sputnik which is not an easy fucking task to make so when you go at it it's like i was like i was ready to just be like yeah i guess it's interesting but it doesn't do anything for me but to my everlasting surprise this album first of all in the best of ways like there there i cannot emphasize this enough on a pure sound level it's mana from fucking heaven compared to what you've been going through and i don't even say that like from like in a comparison way like i think it's a very well produced album it sounds good it sounds a hell of a lot better than death magnetic does i don't think it's like It's not cleanly produced. It's not, like, it doesn't sound like other Metallica records. In fact, it doesn't really sound like many other Lou Reed records. But it is effectively produced, and that's the important thing. And I feel the 
aggressively sexual lyrics and the weird, violent, macabre things are like, yeah, they're off-putting, and yeah, they can like turn you away from it, but I feel Lou is is not only subverting things here, he's also making a point here that like just sort of the way I think society and humanity treats women just as as sexual objects. He is taking this to like a beyond parodic extent and and pushing it to the terms of like using the music of Metallica, the notoriously angry and and throttling music of Metallica, as Tyler mentioned, and trying to push this this extreme boundary. And I don't think it's like, oh, it's this lol random experience. Like, no, I think there is there is intent here. Uh, like Tyler, there is there's mixed results. I think the first two songs again, first two songs and and Mistress Dread, um, not completely into um, musically, just because I don't feel their progressions are very satisfying. I do digest this like I would a late era Swans album in the sense that I interpret it like. I, I view it like To Be Kind or, or The Glowing Man, where it's these, these movements that are building something, tension, release. And I don't think these tracks do that as well. And I also feel like the, the, the vocal chemistry between um, Lou and, and Jason, or not, yeah, Jason, is... Um, the the noted, noted Metallica vocalist, Jake and Jason Newstead. <laughs> Jason Newstead. Um, the, for this Jake album. And, J- Jake and Bacon. <laughs> What anyway? The the vocal chemistry between the two of them is uh, it, it it clashes, and in some songs it works better than others. Sometimes it just feels sometimes it feels awkward. Sometimes it feels like a like a battle between the two of them, and sometimes they sing in unison, which I actually really like because it creates like it's a it, it's a very again Michael Jira effect of just being really disorienting and fucking weird, just because they have like you have again lead singer like Lou Lou's voice isn't great but in many respects this kind of reminds me of my favorite Tom Waits album Real Gone where Tom does not always sound good but he is like like on Hoist That Rag where he's just like he sounds like a monster he sounds like a cartoon character it's kind of funny and there's lots of moments on this album that is really funny and maybe they're not supposed to but I think the album really Hits, it's begins to hit its stride uh, on the fifth track, which I'll shout out as being my favorite, and being Iced Honey. I really like this song. I think it's a great song. I think lyrically it might be the strongest work here. Um, but there is just a, a way that Lou, like, again, this album just sort of has this reputation of being, like, wacky and random, but it's, like, it feels very, very purposeful, and it feels a lot more focused here, and there's lots of really satisfying builds and just really like disgusting lurid if, if you can get into the vibe of this being a, a filthy and macabre and just generally deranged album there is a lot to like here it's to mixed results but i almost think that an album like this that's so thoroughly committing to what this is doing it, it almost needs mixed results to succeed if that even makes any sense and again some fucking how this album's longer songs are almost uniformly its best and that is just that's just not been the case with the last three albums or four albums really it's just like i'll get to a song like dragon which tyler said dragon great song tune your dad i'm not bored for a single second of that and pumping blood just not again not a like hugely long track especially in comparison but like it's so intense and yeah. visceral in a way that the band has not been and in the context of their career this really this album only benefits as being like it is definitely weird just because it's like metallica is not only the biggest metal band on earth they're one of the biggest bands ever in general and they did this and you know i i, I have to stand back and say like you know fucking good for you guys because i genuinely don't think like do you think that fucking dave mustaine and megadeth would make lulu because uh highly doubt uh press x to doubt but again if you're looking for an interesting post-rock adjacent experience to go with here or if you are specifically a fan of lou reed and lou reed's music 
I think there's a lot to like here and it doesn't always work, but I would be like, to say I didn't enjoy the experience would be a lie because I, I did. It, it is a, even when, at its worst, it is fascinating. So, you know. Yeah. Very good. All right. Who's next? I guess uh, I can can go go for it, August. I can speak. Uh, I feel you all have made pretty uh, points that have covered most of most of what I've I've felt about this album. But I guess what's made this album interesting to me is how it's kind of, I've kind of developed and sat on it. Because when I first listened to this album, I, I thought it was like just really, I mean, I got this impression of it being like really just overwhelming and kind of, I, I was like, geez, this is just, this is ungodly intense. And I was just like, well, uh, I, I don't know how I felt like felt about that, uh, and I just kind of, I kind of left it on the back burner for a while and let it sit on me. And I, I kept having this, this increasing thing where I would hear like the goofy lines from this album, like the "I am the table" type stuff, and there was always something about that. I started thinking like, huh, maybe. Maybe there's something more to this, and I feel that's almost the genius in this album's weirdness in that it uses that weirdness to kind of compel you into the deeper, more serious, long-winded tracks like Junior Dad, Dragon, and so on. And I, I feel this album, it's, and and not to be like, not to do like a, a gatekeeping thing, but this this is like an album where it has a very specific audience it wants to appeal to, and it has it has no reservations in turning away people who 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 aren't here for what it's trying to do. That be this like big sexual kind of gross disturbing album and i mean if you're not there for that that's perfectly fine but i mean i've i've just found it's an album that it it, it's an album that just seems so coarse and abrasive but i think there's really an emotional heart to it that in in songs of course like dragon junior dad where i don't know you just gotta i just think people who don't like this album just really you you just gotta not take it at such face value, and I think it's worth reading into. It's an interesting, if flawed, album in all the ways people have mentioned. I think as well, just to add something, there's probably like a real. It seems to me that there's purposeful structure here. Like the the most um, jarring tracks are put at the start to jar you, um, to make it clear to you that this is like not going to be what you would normally expect from Metallica to kind of refix your um, point of view basically so that so that to kind of clear the canvas maybe so that they can then um, present something new I mean I'm not saying that that necessarily makes the album makes those tracks work uh, it doesn't but it, 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 I think that it's kind of purposeful like like you can't tell me that um, you know it's not just I am the table as a line that's funny it's it's no the repetition of it and also the way that it's delivered the real uh yeah. seriousness of of James's delivery of that line like it's it's the fo- the focus of the line shifts from the emphasis being on table initially and i believe in most of the repetitions the emphasis is on i am i am i am oh, yeah, which is just so funny um, because it's like uh, um, it's, it's, it's it makes hilarious. it sound it makes it sound like someone's trying to tell him he's not a table and he's disagreeing. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and I have uh, no and doubt. He... It's, there's no doubt in my mind that 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 Lou is cogent of how that sounds, and so it, Maybe, it makes me think yeah. about what is the purpose of it then. Uh, no, and it exactly. seems to me as though the purpose is, like I said, to sort of pervert Metallica as an idea in, in, in various different ways and then kind of present a new uh, 
uh, possibility for what Metallica could be uh, with with what happens later in the record. So um, yeah, it doesn't. It is kind of a bit of a mixed bag in terms of whether that interpretation kind of comes off for me as a whole. But I think that um, you know it's interesting to think about the record in different ways like that. And I mean, maybe there's like something in whatever the hell this is adapted from, where like there's some symbolic purpose about a table like <laughs> maybe there's something there but i i'm not i feel like you would convinced. lose the mystique like i love not knowing it, it's it, there's something magical about that to me no you're you're absolutely correct mm. i mean Morgan, just as purposeful though. as it clearly is for lou to start the record by saying i would cut my legs and tits off then I think it must be equally purposeful for Lou to have James say, I am the table ad nauseum over this really hilariously, hilarious um, uh, groove and beat that's just like so like uh, mainstream radio driven. Like it seems like it's obviously it's the single, but it's like really trying to be the single. So it's really funny to have that contrast between like the most mainstream sounding like uh, even though it's very heavy, but it's still like the most mainstream melody that Metallica have performed in a long time, and yet it's contrasted with with what every every single thing that is being said. Of someone who actively despises you. Yeah, yeah. Which is a fun line, actually. It is. There's no shift of worshiping someone who despises you, because that's probably how a lot of Metallica fans feel. I was gonna say emblematic yeah. of this uh, the the, re- the yeah. reaction to this release, and I feel like that 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 couldn't be a mistake, you know. Like they had to know what they were doing. Like someone someone down the line had an idea. But I mean, Morgan, I, the, I I like look Metallica have demonstrated time and time again that they have absolutely zero self awareness. So frankly, I give all the credit here to Lou. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. But but, but more again. Morgan, yeah, what do you think? The person least likely to fuck with this by far. Yeah, um, completely sympathetic to everybody when this came out who turned on the album and heard Brandenburg Gate and then shut it right the hell off again. Because, I mean, it's, it's so bizarre in a way that just isn't very compelling at all. It just kind of shuffles along till it reaches its conclusion. And then the view starts, which is in a, a back catalog, especially in the last 20 years of their career, of truly hilarious songs. This is maybe the funniest. <laughs> oh, and it's so good. And it, it's, it, it, but on both the parts of Lou and the and the band themselves, it's it's just it's so strange. Like you just sit, you just listening to it, and you're like, "How did this happen?" But like, why is it so funny? And who <laughs> who authorized this? <laughs> But, like, at this point, it's like, this is easily, no matter what, this is easily the most interesting thing they've done from 1991 up until this point. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah. You don't even, I don't even like it. I just think it's interesting. Yeah. And that I, goes for pretty much the whole first half of the album. It's just like this is a really fascinating experiment. It I don't think it worked uh for for that portion. Um but it is interesting. But the back half of the album is just like I think this is so lowly rated in so many places just because I I genuinely don't think a lot of people have heard the the, the entirety of this album. Yep. It's just become such a meme at this point. But and the reason I think that is because of how dramatically shifted the level of quality is from the back half to the front half because the back half is like breathtaking sometimes. Oh yeah. In, no, in absolutely. Both, it's, it's beauty and it's commitment to vulgarity. It's, 
it's really it takes you back you know it's like i did not expect either of these people involved in this project to make this stuff but here it is i mean wow and like it's it's fascinating in all of the ways that the front half is but it's also like good to, to and compelling to listen to so it's just um yeah I, I, I like lulu i still haven't really come to grips with that but here we are it's a fun record to come back to like i don't listen to it too often but every time i come back to it i don't like, think i could and i like it <laughs> like, no, no, i don't no, sure, think it's on sure. record but every time i come back to, to it which is like maybe once every couple of years because i've, I've yeah. had this record in my life for a while surprisingly um there was a time where the only two metallica albums i'd heard were <laughs> master of puppets and this <laughs> That's um, hilarious. The most Tyler shit I've ever heard in my but fucking I, life. I, I quickly rectified that, please, before you jump down my throat. I, I no, I mean... This you're on just, a podcast yes. talking about the Metallica discography. Nobody's going to jump down your throat. No, no they obviously, you, obviously you rectified that. Yeah, yeah but virtually busted in. But, but yeah, that. um, I do... Yeah, I do think that it's... uh, if if So long as you don't, like... Yeah, coming back to it after a while, it always kind of surprises me in a way, in a pleasant way, uh, and it's always I think engaging. Even during the stretches where it kind of does drone on a little bit during the midsection, uh, it's still kind of um, I still enjoy it. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I yeah I particularly really enjoy um, uh, Pumping Blood, which I think is an underrated song. I mean, I'd, I yeah, that's just the riffs in that song and just the chemistry of the instrumentation. And that song was just so fucking good. Anyway, yeah, um, favorite tracks, least favorite tracks. Okay, yep. who wants to go first? Uh, yeah, jams and tea, I fucking guess. Sure. Uh, I'll say uh, "Iced Honey" is my favorite track, and then I'll say "Dragon" and uh, "Junior Dad" are, are closely followed behind. Uh, not the only highlights, but definitely the highest highlights. Uh, I'll say my least favorite track is probably like for as much joy as it has brought me and for as much of a fucking meme as it is the view is just it's it it really stumbles out of the gate and really does like it's a hurdle you you just have to get over um so I'll say the view um thank god for pumping blood and I'll get I'll give the album a a, a light to decent six uh myself i would say my favorite tracks are uh junior dad dragon and pumping blood my least favorites probably cheat on me and i would i would be confident with a six out of ten for this album uh, my three favorite tracks are uh junior dad uh, which is maybe the least funny song on the album, but it has the funniest name. Yeah, no. right? um, <laughs> um, and yeah, Love and being then a Junior Dad, and then Dragon, and uh, I want to shout out Mr. Dread. I liked that song. Um, my least favorite was probably uh, Brandenburg Gate, and uh, six out of ten. For Lulu Reed and Metallica's Lulu. Lulu, Lulu, hey. Lulu. Um, okay, so my three favorite tracks are Dragon, Junior Dead, and Pumping Blood. Uh, but fuck, I also really like uh, Mr. Street, Little Dog, and Frustration. Um, yeah. And <laughs> my least favorite track is, is definitely Brandenburg Gate. Um, and I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10. All right. Vulgar auteurism. Guilty is charged, I guess. I, don't fucking I mean, know. I guess. I... No, I mean, we're not because we don't like the last four. So, As far as I'm concerned, yeah, that's we true. are four of five people who have heard this album in full and the other one is Anthony Fantano. Anthony Fantano? <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> you know I mean, what? You're right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... So, um, the return to form in the mainstream consensus well, if you don't consider if you consider this yeah. an idea yeah uh, would be 2016's hardwired self-destruct 
Yeah. Uh, which, you know, I'm not going to front. If we call Lulu a Lou Reed record rather than a Metallica record, which I think it is really, yeah. Hardwired is. Uh, no, I think that's since fair. the Black Album. I'm going to say that. Put that yeah, out there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, Un- not unquestionably, a, honestly. Not, gonna, not a question in my mind that it not is. Not going to drop yeah. a hot take there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is so satisfying about Hardwired to self destruct, even though it is a. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's like Deadpool is Oh, no. And oh my God. Satoshi Kone hasn't come up with anything that scary. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Um, I know what's, yeah. Wow. What, yeah. what is uh, what, so nice to surprise about Hardwired itself? What is so nice to surprise about this album is that it, it has energy, like, and, and not in the, in the faux Metallica, like, we're going to try to sound cool gonna try to write right to our old right to our old strengths this is just like the, it, it it genuinely feels like they pulled songs out of like b-sides from the 80s at least for some of these not for all of these it feels like they took some 80s b-sides and like made them in the way modern metallica would just remaster. So, uh, well, that's exactly what I see, what I have in my notes for, for uh, one of the yeah. tracks in particular. It sounds like they've just pulled stuff from the eighties and just re-recorded it and remastered or remastered it. Yeah, uh, no, that's that's this basically feel. the best strength of Hardwired to Self Destruct, and it really is only a strength in the set. Well, it's, it's it's a strength, but like it's especially buoyed because of comparison. But this sounds good. Like, yeah, oh, thank gosh, God, this album sounds, sounds like... good. It, it's it's produced. Oh. Yeah, it, it's it's and, it's and got you know what? Wait. Yeah, it, it it just sounds really good. Like the opening track, Hardwired, is basically everything I think you could want from a Metallica thrash track in 2016. It is short. Yeah. It's it hits hard. Three minutes long. It's uh, not embarrassingly juvenile, although that does pop up at certain parts of the record. No, it definitely does. And it yeah. sounds good. And and that's the rule here. Um, this is really the best the first time since uh the 90s that a metallica record has sounded good and production wise oh. uh, you can hear everything the riffs and, and sound crisp uh... but not overblown the drums are punchy but not tinny i think um listen in particular to lars's fills on on now that we're dead are like really really like propulsive and heavy yeah. and Lars sounds good generally across this record which was i was not expecting coming into it absolutely um, he's not going to win any awards for drumming but it, it sounds good um uh it's not a consistently great album in terms of songwriting um but it manages to sound great without requiring a massive change of sound for the band which i guess at this point is an achievement um they're basically now in their elder statesman status where they can keep making albums like this for the rest of their career and and generally kind of build their reputation back up again even if they are really when it boils down to it just exceedingly fine that's still you know i'll take it um, yeah seriously they sound unified and energetic on a track like the fantastic atlas rise which mm. i really love i love that song i loved it i remember when it first came out in 2016 and i was like oh okay actually are metallica good now <laughs> um and it's it's a good song it's a, i still think it's, it holds up um that said uh the the notion of Metallica essentially just making an 80s era record in 2016 does wear thin eventually, especially when they are still absolutely uh, stubbornly refusing to edit their albums. I, I think that's especially apparent once you get to the second disc of this oh, two-disc yeah. album. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Look, if this was just the first disc, this would be a, a great album. Yeah, yep. the first disc. The first disc, pl- the first disc plus spit out the bone. I, yeah. yeah, spit out the bone is one of the best yeah. closers they've got. Honestly, yeah. like if if that was a seven track Metallica album, I mean, I could honestly comfortably say it's one of their best. Yeah, that'd be like a solid eight out of ten record. Right honestly, there. like, jeez, that would be good. Yeah. But I mean, at the end of the day, we can't overlook a song like Confusion. (laughs) 
which is what really an aptly titled song. It's really complacent and it has Hetfield uh, resurrecting that most tiresome lyrical writing technique confusion, delusion. Uh, you know, I've said before that I hate when he does that more than anything, and it, yeah, it is not welcome here. Uh, probably the the song I like the least, or the song I most dislike is "Here Comes Revenge," which I think is really Bad. over over long Bad. and trite, and is really I think one of the few moments on the record where the song just just generally sucks. Like most of the lyrically scenes, speaking, it is not good. No, 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 definitely uh, most. But yeah, most of the God. songs that are weak on this record are just kind of like mid or mediocre, yep. rather yep. than outright <laughs> bad, which is nice. Um, but I do think that here comes revenge is the is is bad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. What do you guys think about this record? I don't, I've only really not. I've not spent that much time with it, honestly. But I enjoyed it. You honestly fucking said it, man. Like I, it's it, there's just nothing to disagree with. I mean, the second half kind of lags, but spit out the bone almost fools you into thinking that it's worth it to to go through. Like I, I don't think. It might be the worst titled Metallica song, but Man Unkind, eh, it's definitely one of those more aggressively mid-tracks. And then in going into Here Comes Revenge, it's just like, oh, this is definitely a drag point in the album. And then you yeah. get to Am I Savage, and it's just like, what's going on here, guys? And then Murder One's like, fine, uh, I guess. And then Spit Out the Bone, it's just like, where was this the entire time? I, I, I like this. And yeah. I don't, I'm not like a huge fan of Halo on Fire. Like it's, it's a decent song, but like Spit Out the Bone, like if, if we said if it was just the first disc, like that's clearly the song that should be the closer here. But like, just as somebody who is fucking fed up with the way the old Metallica records, the mid Metallica uh, albums sounded, it's just that this is a breath of fresh air. And that even for it's like, it's got significant low, like, or not even significant low points. It's just got things that make it kind of like, it, it's just things that make it kind of sluggish, I guess. And it's like, if you, if you cut it, if you cut it by like a couple fucking songs, you'd have a genuinely great, like, like we didn't mention like Moth into Flame. What oh. a good fucking song. Yeah, that's a good song. And it's I like, like emotional one. too. And it's like, this is what I fucking want from this band. And it convinces me that they are still capable of making good music, which for all of this album's mid tendencies, that is the greatest accomplishment they have done throughout their career is make convince me after all of that bullshit that they still got a few great songs left in them. Yeah. No, I, I mean, agree. There, there's times on this album where, where they are most definitely, like, running in circles, like, songwriting-wise. But then, yeah, you've got the spark of, the sparks of originality or, like, just enjoyment, like the aforementioned, you know, Hardwired, Atlas, Ride, Rise, Moth into Flame. You've just got these moments where they are, like, they are there, and you're like, "Wow, this, th this is you. Are you the Are you the same band who did uh, Saint Anger, Death Magnetic, Load and Reload? It, it feels like you're listening to like a different band entirely, and that's the best compliment I can give it. That it doesn't. It, it, it at points can remind me of that era of Metallica, but. It also, but at the same time, it doesn't. It doesn't feel like that era of Metallica. I mean, honestly, if if whatever project they put out after this, it takes the ideas that are good from this album and uh, like just cranks them up even more, we might be looking at a, a genuinely like a good to great Metallica album in the future. I don't think that's going to happen, granted. I'm just saying it's a it's if it's a under nice an hour, that'll have. be a start, you know? Yeah, like a fifty minute long a Metallica record. Can you fucking imagine? Like if they could like make a swan song. Like I wouldn't be terribly disappointed if this was their last album. Like good. You've you've managed to end it on a good note. Fine. But if you're hell bent and convinced that you want to make more fucking music at this age Please, for the love of God, do what you've been doing. Just do less of it. 
Yeah, no. I mean, I would, I would rather have something that has has just brevity rather than just making these full out epics. And I, I will compliment the album in the sense that uh, the the decision to divide this album into like two discs, so to speak. I, I do give credit to it because it at least gives me the impression that Metallica is giving you like the the notion that this album is not essential to be enjoyed as, as just one piece yeah. where their other albums are just like fucking 14 songs on one disc. Like that, yeah. that like you get what I mean, that divide there. It, while it's not a much, choice it's that a, feels purposeful. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like, it actually feels like they considered no, structure and pace. Yeah. Mm. No, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's so weird talking about this album after everything we've just gone through, because this is... I, it, it's I, not great. It's just good, and I love that about yeah, it. Yeah, I'm glad that we get to end this on, you know, something of yeah. a positive note, at least. A light in the dark. Yeah, definitely. I'll just, uh, I'll be very quick about my thoughts on this because it's almost midnight here, and yeah, no, this I'm has sorry. Uh, this has yeah. drained me. <laughs> um, but that was to be expected. Um, yeah, I, I there's, I still can't help but be a little disappointed in this album. But I was, I was like really in the thick of it when this album came out you know i was like eagerly anticipating its release like i drove to the uh, record store a uh, town over and i got the, the cd of it you know like it was it was like an event and even after that i couldn't help but find it a little disappointing but that said, I, th- I think the first half is really strong. Um, songs like Atlas Rise and Moth into Flame and Halo on Fire, I think are like ideal late career Metallica cuts. Like this is what they should have been sounding like from 1991 forward. And it's, it's honestly really nice to have that sound like intact in the in a modern package uh but the back half is it just feels again like they just kind of threw in the leftovers that they felt that they couldn't leave out for some reason like man unkind and confusion and especially here comes revenge they're just kind of and thankfully it does end very strongly with spit out the bone which is just a killer song but you know, it's good, but it's a mixed bag. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, cool. They were tracks. All right, I'll go first since we've been doing the other direction heaps. Um, <laughs> my three favorite tracks are um, "Spit Out the Bone," "Atlas Rise," and "Hardwired." Um. My least favorite track is Here Comes Revenge, as I said. Uh, and this album gets a light six from me. Mm. Yeah, my uh, my favorite tracks are, if I can open my damn phone, uh, Dream No More, Halo on Fire, and Moth into Flame. And my least favorite is Here Comes Revenge. And I am also feeling a light six. Uh, my three favorite tracks are, let's say, uh, Moth into Flame, Hardwired, and Spit Out the Bone. I, too, am feeling a six out of ten. Jake, be frozen again. Yep. Jake, okay. I think you're... God, Jesus Christ. What are your rating? Yeah. What's your favorite tracks in rating for Hardwired? 
Uh, hardwired, favorite tracks from Moth into Flame, Atlas Rise, and Spit Out the Bone. Uh, least favorite track, gotta go with Here Comes Revenge, and I will give it a decent 6 out of 10. Well, look at that, four sixes. 0. 0.0 standard deviation. Well, that's a nice way to end. It yeah. is. Yeah. Okay, I mean, well, it's an optimistic note to end on. As is customary for these things, we should do our album rankings and top 10 tracks. Um, for this band yeah. um, mm. but album rankings should be fairly easy to cycle through so let's just do those really quickly um, Jake do you want to do your Metallica album ranking yeah um, we well, have how many do we have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten, ten. eleven well eleven including okay. Lulu okay. yeah so, so we might as well yeah. include it since let's, we discussed it yeah let's see in last place we have, unsurprisingly, Reload. Uh, in second to last place, we have Saint Anger. At number nine, I have Load. Number eight, Death Magnetic. Number seven, Hardwired to Self-Destruct. Number six is Lulu. Number five is The Black Album. Number four, is And Justice for All. Number three is Master of Puppets. Number two, Kill Em All. And number one, Ride the Lightning. Yeah. August. All right, my Metallica ranking. At the bottom, I'd have to go with uh, Saint Anger. Uh, number nine and ten are, uh, I guess, Reload and Load, with Load being placed ever so slightly above it. Uh, eight is Death Magnetic. Uh, seven is, I guess I'll say, I guess I'll say Hardwired. Uh, six is The Black Album. Five is Lulu. Um, Four is uh, Metal Up Your Ass, a.k.a. Uh, Kill Em All. Three is And Justice For All. Uh, number two is Master of Puppets. And number one is Ride the Lightning. Very good. Hey, Paul. Uh, Morgan, your ranking. All right. From worst to best, uh, 11 is Reload. 10 is Load. 9 is Saint Anger. Eight is Death Magnetic. Seven is Hardwired. Six is Lulu. Five is The Black Album. Four is Master of Puppets. Three is Ride the Lightning. Two is Kill Em All. And number one is And Justice for All. Hey. Such a Morgan ranking. I love yes, you. it is. Absolutely. And I realized that as I was reading it. Yeah, it was like so, it was like so conventional, like up to a certain point, and then it just became very Morgan towards the end. I feel like that's also my list. Um, okay, my ranking is uh, number 11 is St. Anger, uh, number 10 is Reload, number 9 is uh, Load, number 8 is Death Magnetic, number 7 is uh, Hardwired to Self Destruct, number 6 is uh, The Black Album, at number 5 is Lulu. At number four is Kill Em All. At number three is Injustice for All. At number two is Ride the Lightning. And number one is Master of Puppets for me. Yeah. So I think we have some nice variation there. And let's just go around again with our, uh, if you have t them ready or if you want to improvise your top 10 Metallica tracks. I'll do top five just for the sake of brevity. Okay, cool. Fair, That's fine. Fair enough. I have my 10 ready. I do too. Okay. Uh, well, let's go reverse order this time. I'll go All first. Right. Why not? So Keep Jake hard. can put things together. Yeah. Uh, so 10, Creeping Death. 9, The Unforgiven. 8, Dyer's Eve. 7, Welcome Home Sanitarium. 6, The Four Horsemen. 5, 1. 4, Dragon. Three, Master of Puppets. Two, Fade to Black. One, Orion. Nice. Uh, Morgan. 
at number 10, uh, Jump in the Fire. Nine, Welcome Home Sanitarium. Eight, To Live is to Die. Seven, Ride the Lightning. Six, One, Five, The Four Horsemen. Four, Disposable Heroes. Three, Creeping Death. Two, Blackened. And one, No Remorse. Disposable Heroes. I was that. Oh, so painful leaving that off my list. That would have been yeah. my 11. Boy. Hey. My, my list hey. creation was, was painful. This is only representative of how I feel now, and this could easily change on that moment's notice. Number 10, Seek and Destroy. Number 9, Welcome Home Sanitarium. Number 8 is 1. Number 7 is Fade to Black. Number 6 is Creeping Death. Number 5 is Dyer's Eve. Number 4 is Hit the Lights. Number 3 is Blackened. Number 2 is Ride the Lightning. And number 1 is Battery. Nice. I hated yeah. leaving Battery off. Yeah. I just hated, I, I hated leaving, off. leaving so many of the songs off. Yeah. All of those albums off. It's a pain. Actually, I'm just going to go ahead and improvise my top 10 because as everybody's saying, it's painful leaving some songs off. So uh, this is a very loose order. Uh, but I will say uh, number 10, I'll say Jump in the Fire. Uh, number nine, No Remorse. Uh, number eight, Battery. Number seven. <sighs> number seven, I will say Blackened. Number six, I will say... Uh, this is so fucking hard. Number six, I'll say, say Welcome Home. Number five, One. Number four, Master of Puppets. Number three, Ride the Lightning. Number two, uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls. And number one, Fade to Black. Actually, wait, hold on. I'm going to replace my number two and say uh, The Four Horsemen, because I can't forget The Four Horsemen. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Well, if you are watching and have stuck with us through this inexorable trudge through the back half of this discography, please tell us what you think of these albums, and uh, if you disagree with our rankings or our reviews, um, yeah, please let us know in the comments and below. if you disagree with the Lulu, listen to the album in full. Yeah, yes. you, and if you still disagree, like, shut the fuck up. You're not funny. I feel like, I feel like Frodo at the end of Return of the King. Uh, we, I right, never so go far. back. Okay. And as always, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Skittles, taste the rainbow.